toutes. Thank you Hello, for joining Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And a warm welcome as well to members of the public viewing this on YouTube. Please note there are two different YouTube streams, one in English and one in French. Je souhaite la bienvenue et remercie les membres du Conseil de... So I welcome everyone from the Public Health Service, councillors, the City Council. Thank you very much for any, to any participant that are using the YouTube. Understand that we have a French-speaking YouTube channel and an English-speaking YouTube channel. So, this is for an update about COVID in Ottawa. My name is Catherine Laska, and I will be your moderator. Je m'appelle Catherine Laska, et je suis. My name is Catherine Laska, and I'm your moderator for today. Before we begin, for those joining us on Zoom today, you may select the Globe Interpretation button button in the bottom menu to hear today's briefing in English or in French. You may also choose to keep this deactivated. Uh, and to hear the floor audio as is. Those with accessibility needs can pin in the ASL interpreters, Brenda, excuse me, ASL interpreters, Brenda and Chris in Zoom, or follow along on the YouTube stream. So for those who are following up on Zoom, you can actually listen to the technical session today uh, using interpretation button at the bottom. You can choose the language of your choice. If this is deactivated, you will you listen to the floor. For those who are using the ASQ, LSQ, ASQ interpreters, it's on YouTube. The PowerPoint presentation today is bilingual. You will have the first slide in English and then the second one in French. This afternoon, we will be hearing remarks from Councillor Keith Eglai, Chair of Ottawa Public Health Board. Councillor Keith Eglai is the Chair of the Ottawa Health Council. Deputy Medical Officer of Health, the Médecin Chef Adjoint en Santé Publique. Available for questions from the councillors, members of Board of Health, and media following the statements. We also have. Disponible pour répondre aux questions des médias. Available to answer your questions. We have also today Steve Kanalakis. Anthony DeMonte, General Manager of Emergency Protective Services, the Director General des Services de Protection et d'Urgence. Daniel Chenier. General Manager, Recreation and Facility Services, the Director General des Services de Protection et d'Urgence. After opening remarks and presentations today, Councillor Keith Aglai will take questions from council members and members of the board in alphabetical order. Suite à la présentation, le conseiller Keith Aglai... After the introduction today, Councillor Aglai will be there to answer your question and we'll take them in alphabetical order. We will have a 10 minute break and then we will move forward to the media session. Sorry, just unmuting myself, the, uh, the word of the year, the term of the year. Thank you, Catherine. Um, good afternoon. Bonjour, Quay. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, it's been a bit of a busy day. We had council this morning and post council media availabil availability. Um, but the purpose of this technical briefing is to provide an update on the current COVID-19 situation in Ottawa and talk about the actions we can take as individuals and as a community to help protect each other. Dr. Brent Milwaukee will, pre will be presenting the most recent information regarding the transmission of COVID in our city. After Dr. Milwaukee concludes his presentation, Board of Health members and councillors will then have up to five minutes per speaker to ask questions of staff. While we recognize the vaccines are a vital part of the COVID-19 response and that there may be questions related to enforcement issues as well, such as early part closures, we ask that questions in this briefing focus on the content discussed in Dr. Milwaukee's presentation. Once the doctor's presentation is, com is completed, we will take questions in relation to it from counselors and Board of Health members. Following that, a second opportunity will be made available to ask questions of Anthony DeMonte, Dan Chenier, and Steve Kanoakis regarding other issues such as enforcement. 
Following the conclusion of these question and answer periods, there will be a 10 minute break. When we return from the break, members of the media will have an opportunity to ask questions to all available staff. This technical briefing, including the post-break question and answer period with media, can also be viewed live on Ottawa Public Health's YouTube channel in French or English. We know that there's a lot going on and appreciate you joining us and your interest in this technical briefing. It's important that we have this conversation and that the Ottawa residents understand the, 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 the current situation. While today's update is not vaccine focused, I do want to address something. Vaccines are a huge part of the COVID-19 response, but it will take months until enough of the population is vaccinated for it to be safe to relax public health measures. I've heard from several residents and I've seen discussions online about people who have recently been vaccinated, visiting and dining with people they don't live with or planning to visit children or grandchildren. The simple message is we are not there yet. This is dangerous and is helping to contribute to the further spread of COVID in Ottawa. My apologies for interrupting. I think you're on mute, Councillor. I see that I'm on mute, thank you. Um, I'm not sure where I left off. About 30 um, seconds. Chair, about th it, it's, it's Brent here. You were just talking about uh, people who have been vaccinated uh, seeing family and you were, uh, I think you were able to finish your sentence that, that we're not there yet. And then we, okay. then we lost you. Okay, fair enough. It's a good, it's, it's good to repeat even, even so, yeah, so we, we aren't there yet. Um, getting together, it's dangerous and is helping to contribute the further spread of COVID in Ottawa. The COVID-19 vaccine provides protection from severe illness and death. The, the vaccines do not prevent you from getting the virus or potentially giving it to someone else. I myself have received my first dose of the vaccine last week at one of our local pharmacies. And as much as I would love to be able to give my oldest son, Ben, a hug, who doesn't live with us right now and hasn't for a little while, I have to wait a little bit longer. We've gotten through 13 months and we have to stay the course. We are here today because there's a high level of community transmission of the virus in Ottawa. The best way to stop transmission of the virus is to stay at home and follow public health advice, such as masking and physical distancing whenever you interact with people outside your household, even if you are vaccinated. Vaccination efforts continue to ramp up, and I want to thank the teams at Ottawa Public Health and the City's Emergency Operations Centre for their efforts, as well as the local pharmacists and um, some of our primary caregivers as well, who have been added to the vaccine rollout. Soon enough, everyone who wants to be vaccinated will be able to get their shot. But we have to focus on what we can do right now to help to protect our friends, our families, and our neighbors from COVID-19. That being said, I would now like to invite Dr. Brent Milwaukee, Deputy Medical Officer of Health, to say a few words. Great, thank you, uh, Chair Eglai, for that introduction and good afternoon to everyone who's uh, joining us here this afternoon. I am uh, Brent Malachny, the Deputy Medical Officer of Health here at Ottawa Public Health. And today I'm gonna to be providing an update on our COVID-19 situation here in Ottawa. Aujourd'hui, je présente une mise à jour sur la COVID-19. We present you an update on what's going on in Ottawa and COVID-19. The situation in Ottawa is the worst that it has been to date during this pandemic. That our healthcare system, if trends continue, will be for the first time at significant risk. That minimizing the impact of that means bending the curve now. And that while VOCs, variants of concern, are an additional challenge with this wave, our individual and collective actions can be effective at bending that wave. Where we are right now, and I'm gonna show in subsequent slides the following, that the weekly rate that we're seeing is the highest it's been since the beginning of the pandemic. The number, the proportion of people, the percent of individuals testing positive has increased as well. 
We have been seeing numerous outbreaks in a variety of settings, whether it be workplaces, schools, hospitals, uh, sports and recreation venues, um, and others. And in addition, um, the hospitalizations and ICU admissions are highest since the beginning of the pandemic. And more details and this information is available uh, and updated daily on, on our website, um, which is shown at the bottom of the screen. And if I could have the next slide, please. So this slide shows the, the numbers of newly reported COVID-19 cases by week. Um, and what you can see are the series of waves that we've been through. I mean, while we typically talk about a third wave, actually this is our, our, really our fifth. Um, and you can see that the current one, that rather um, straight uh, upwards uh, blue line um, is our current one. And you can see how the numbers are so much larger than the previous ones. Uh, admittedly, the first wave last spring, uh, there wasn't as much testing. And so the case numbers uh, are less than they would have been if there was as much testing as there is now. But this is the biggest wave that we've been in. And in recent days, we've been seeing daily reported cases, uh, often over 300, um, when it wasn't so long ago that it was 30. If I could have next slide, please. This busy slide um, is showing what the proportion of people being tested for COVID that are positive. So, so the yellow line um, is, is the average over a seven day period of what proportion of tests are coming back positive. And usually um, there are two signals to us that we're seeing much increased transmission in the community. The first is demand for testing by people who need testing, as well as the proportion that are positive. And, and in recent weeks, we've been seeing both. Our testing partners uh, have been working extra hard trying to add additional hours, additional venues to try and meet demand for people with symptoms and who are close contacts of uh, individuals who are infected with COVID. Um, at the same time, the proportion of tests, and as you can see on the far right hand side, that yellow line is again going up almost straight up exponentially. Um, and we've not seen anything like this in previous waves. You will note on the far left hand side, that is reflective of the first wave. But again, there was very, very little testing going on, uh, which you can see by the dark um, um, uh, bars at the bottom. Essentially only people who are the most severely ill were getting tested and that made the positivity rate artificially high. So again, both in terms of case numbers and the proportion of people testing positive, uh, we've never seen anything like this before. If I can have the next slide. This is probably the most important slide and, and I'm gonna take a little bit more time with it because this shows our hospitalizations and of any of the data types or, or sources of information that I've shown to date, this one is the most reliable. The other ones preceding this depend on people going for testing, testing be, being available. However, if people are sick enough to need hospitalization, that doesn't vary. Um, it's not something that you can choose or not. Uh, if you're having trouble breathing, you're going to need to go to the hospital and they're going to need to admit you. And what you can see on the far right hand side is our current trend in hospitalization, which again is rapidly, rapidly rising um, and is much higher than any of the other peaks that we have seen uh, ever since this uh, COVID pandemic started for us. When I look at those hospitalizations, um, what I'm seeing here is doubling time of about every 12 days. So what I mean by that is that, you know, back in March 18th, we had 24 admissions. 12 days later on March 30th, we were at 47. And then on April 11th, we're at 96. So, so essentially our hospitalizations are doubling every 12 days the ICU admissions are doubling even faster than that. If this trend continues and we continue to double and double our ability of our healthcare system to handle this number of cases of people needing care 
in our hospitals will have extreme difficulty keeping up. Already we are seeing um, scheduled procedures being canceled. We are seeing things that we've never seen before where pediatric hospitals are freeing up space in their ICUs to take on young adults who need care. Our hospitalizations, I would also point out, about 85% of them are people 50 and above. And so that's why our, we're focusing on that age group for immunizations so that we can protect those who are most vulnerable uh, to, to being hospitalized. Cette diapo est très important pour expliquer la situation actuelle. Today is a good moment to explain a little bit what's going on in our hospitals here in Ottawa. So in terms of that doubling, so I said we're only already at about 100 right now. The infections that have already occurred two weeks ago, people, some people are incubating. They haven't become ill yet. Some people are starting to develop symptoms. And then some of those people will go on. To, to require hospitalization. Those infections have already occurred. The need for those hospitalizations has already occurred. They just, it just hasn't happened yet. So the hospitals already are needing to plan not just how they are going to continue to handle 100 uh, patients, but 200. Because if this trend continues, that's the number of hospitalizations um, uh, that will occur sometime by late next week if trends continue. If hospitalizations continue to double, then they'd be looking at 400 hospitalizations and 120 ICU beds, um, which is a completely different order of magnitude and, and a major, major challenge for how they would provide care um, to all of those patients, many of which would need intensive care level care as well as all of the other reasons that people need intensive care that are not COVID related. People with heart attacks, people with strokes, people um, who've been injured in, in trauma incidents. So we are at a major, major point here as a city. Um, and I, I felt it's important to share that, uh, that this is where we are and why we need to focus on bending this curve as quickly as possible. If I can have the next slide, please. Um, I wanna to touch about variants of concern. Um, and, and so first I'll just show the trend. And, and so what you can see here is that, you know, in a fairly short period of time from, from early February to where we are in mid April, We've gone from these VOCs, these, these mutations of the original virus, um, being relatively infrequent to now being the majority. If I could have the next slide, please. The thing about this, though, is that, and, and I hear this from people that, oh, it's VOCs driven, and there's you know, not really anything we can do. It's, it's, it's just the VOCs. And, and so a few things I want to clarify about this. First off, VOCs tr transmit the same way. They, they transmit predominantly by our droplets as we talk and as we breathe, even more so if we shout or sing or are exercising which means they can be prevented the same way as non-VOCs. The other piece here is that, and this is the, the challenging part, is given the opportunity. So if we are talking to someone and they're closer than two meters, um, if we're not wearing a mask, so given the opportunity, there's an increased risk of transmission. Uh, because people who are infected with VOCs tend to produce more um, volume or, or more number of viral particles, making them more infectious. And these mutated viruses um, have changes in their, their spike protein that allow them to stick better to, to, to people's cells. Um, the net impact is, is increased transmission. But the key here is that it can still be prevented the same way. The other thing I would mention is that certainly when we look at the data here in Ottawa, 
even if we take the VOCs out of the picture and we just look at the wild virus, the original virus, which frankly was very good at transmitting all by itself, um, the trend was such that we would be in a resurgence at the current time with the amount of transmission that's occurring. So essentially the VOCs have added fuel to an existing fire. If I can have the next slide, please. Um, I, I'd be remiss if we don't talk about vaccinations at least a little bit in this. Um, you know, happy to say that, um, you know, over uh, the time period when since we started in, in late December, that have you know, over 157,000 doses have been administered, administered to Ottawa residents, focusing on older age groups, because recall, um, the Older age groups are at increasing risk of hospitalization with each decade of life. And as I said, about 85% of our hospitalizations are in those 50 and above. And really the primary goal of our vaccine campaign is to protect the people uh, most at risk for hospitalization and death, um, as well as supporting the neighborhoods who have been disproportionately affected uh, by COVID. And we have a new vaccine uh, dashboard um, so that gets updated daily and is increasingly providing information about what is occurring uh, in, in the vaccine campaign. Um, just briefly, those, those neighborhoods, um, we've identified 21 across the city uh, based on, on uh, from the Ontario Neighborhood uh, Study, those boundaries, uh, which, which makes, you know, I think a lot of sense for us uh, from, from an Ottawa perspective. Um, and there are 21 neighborhoods that we are um, going into these neighborhoods, uh, having uh, pop-up clinics, um, having outreach to, to community groups, providing vaccine in different types of settings, trying different things to increase uptake um, and making vaccine available to those 15 above. Um, just a, a difference in terms of booking for those, if, if one is in one of those uh, priority neighborhoods, and there's a list on our website, um, is that you, it OPH does the bookings for those in contrast to the mass vaccination clinics, which go through the provincial booking system. Um, if I could have the next slide, please. So where we are at is this. So we are in the midst of our biggest resurgence to date. We are dealing with a VOC fueled um, resurgence that with VOCs, given the opportunity, transmission of risk, uh, transmission risk is increased. We are seeing rapidly rising hospitalizations with doubling times of every 12 days that are not going to be sustainable. Um, they're already, as I said, at 100 hospitalizations at the current time, um, planning for 200 for next week. But if it doubles again, uh, then, then that will create real, real challenges to be able to meet that. And what I'm now going to talk about is what we all need to do in order to suppress this wave. If I can have the next slide, please. So, you know, as, as Chair Eglai said, we, we've been at this for, for over a year now. Um, in, in, in some ways, the things to do that work are easy, but, but also hard at the same time. And we're all different. We've all experienced this differently. Um, but I think most of us would say we're, we're tired. Um, and about the only thing that isn't, unfortunately, is the virus. And, and it's brought friends. And, and, and we're at a point where we really need to come together here and suppress this wave um, so that it does not uh, go any further. Um, those things, of course, uh, is, is about uh, distancing um, of two meters or more from people outside your household. Um, we are at a stay at home order and that's, that's to reinforce that we really should be staying at home and only going out uh, for, for essential purposes. Uh, when we go out, we have a mask with us um, so that if we're in an area that there's other people uh, and it's becoming crowded, um, A, you, you may not want to be in another place um, so that's less crowded or come back at another time, but, but to, be, to put your mask on um, right away. Uh, and of course, if you have symptoms, do not go out, do, do not go out and about, um, stay home, isolate from the rest of your family and, and make an appointment to get tested. In addition to, to the province's stay at home order, uh, the province also added the closure of schools um, so that schools will not be reopening next week. And 
this is not really about um, the risk of transmission within schools versus um, the importance of closing schools and, 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 and helping people stay at home uh, and reduce mobility in order to um, reduce the opportunities for transmission of, of the virus. And of course, um, at the same time is continuing to uh, vaccinate people uh, who are most at risk of serious illness and death. The thing I would flag here is that it's not going to help us in terms of the people that are immunized over the next few weeks to get us out of this wave. It's really going to come down to our own behaviors and our own um, work. Um, and it, sometimes it feels like difficult work to, um, to interact with people virtually, uh, to, to, to wear a mask, to be distance, and to uh, reduce opportunities for transmission. If I could have the next slide, please. In addition to, to the provincial orders, um, we are looking here at Op Ottawa Public Health, um, other, other parts of where we can um, contribute. Um, so one of the things that, that we've been hearing about is, is crowding in parks. And, and you know what, parks are extremely important. Um, they're important for our mental health. They're important for opportunities for physical activity, for people who you know, don't have a backyard. Um, it's really important to be able to get outside and, and, and maybe have a picnic with, 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 with your household. Um, it's important to be able to take your children to the park uh, and have them play. So, so parks are really an important part here, but we also have to balance that within the fact that we're in the biggest resurgence uh, that we've ever experienced. And, and one of the things that, that we're seeing is, is a lack of distancing and a lack of mask use in parks, particularly on and around certain amenities. So we're working with partners um, in, in the city to, to develop a section 22 class order um, to address some of these issues for, for, for their summer recreational amenities. And you recall, we did something similar uh, for, for, for winter amenities and uh, with the, uh, the closure of the rinks that, uh, that will be uh, rescinded uh, later this week. Um, but we want to sort of apply the same sort of idea, especially at this time of, of a resurgence where we want people to be outside, but to, to, to be doing it as safe as possible. And so we're working on that uh, section 22 and we'll have it, so the plan is to have it ready in time for the weekend and there'll be communication forthcoming as soon as that's ready. If I could have the next slide, please. The other thing that we've done uh, recently is we issued a, a letter of instruction for businesses that uh, um, while they're required under provincial regulations to actively you know, manage um, or have capacity limits for their stores and have them uh, um, posted, um, what we have done is gone one step further to say to actively manage that. I mean, many stores have done this, but it's variable. Um, and so want that stores that still remain open to, to have a greeter and to be actively tracking uh, the numbers of people and to make sure that their capacity limits are not, uh, are not uh, um, um, have more people than, than allowed, sorry, in, in their capacity limits, um, as well as having the physical distancing and masking in outdoor lineups. Also, if they have two or more cases of, of uh, COVID to contact us so that we understand or can investigate a potential workplace outbreak sooner. Um, and as well as to make employees aware uh, of any benefits and or pay they're entitled to if, if they need to isolate. And more information is available on our workplace uh, um, website. If I could have the next slide, please. Um, we realize this is, this is a challenge. Um, this has been going on a long time. Um, we're, we're, we're all different. We all have different experiences and are having different stressors. Um, we have a number of resources and links um, for, for people to, to be able to seek information, be able to seek help. Um, there are, uh, as the slide shows, supports for, for parents uh, of school-aged children, um, as well as supports to workplaces and small businesses. We've been working with faith leaders and, and providing guidance, um, as well as uh, um, some additional um, um, assistance and support uh, because they often counsel individuals uh, in 
distress in their congregations. And so we've been supporting that. Um, we have a series of uh, mental health videos, uh, including uh, those dealing with, with racism, um, which uh, we'll be launching uh, in support of Mental Health Week, which is the first week of May. And at the end of this presentation, uh, there are um, uh, links, uh, as I said, uh, for this information and, uh, and, and resources. So I want to end this um, to say, you know, we, we have a task ahead of us. And we have a task as individuals and families and as a city to, to, to basically bend this curve right now. Um, you know, we want to encourage people to stay home as much as possible and only going out when it's essential. But it, it is also important to experience the outdoors and, and to, uh, to get physical activity, but not to gather. Um, and to remember to be distancing, masking, and, and washing your hands. Um, limit your contact to only those inside your household. Uh, people are stressed, be kind, and, and to yourself and others. Um, and, and check in with your own mental health and, and seek help if, uh, if, if need be. Um, it's, it's still not the time to be uh, interacting with people outside your household. Uh, yes, we have close to 20% of, of the population who has received one dose of vaccine, um, but that's not being fully vaccinated. Plus we have more transmission of COVID going on now than any other time. So, you know, for those who've been immunized, it, it's important to continue following all of the, uh, of the public health measures. Um, so I'm going to stop here now. Thank you for attention. I look forward to your questions. Um, so thank you. Merci and miigwech. Thank you very much, doctor, um, for that very detailed, um, presentation. So as I indicated, we're going to go through the first round of questions uh, alphabetically between members of uh, council and members of the board. Uh, these questions I would ask, as I said, to be related to what uh, Dr. Wachney has presented. There'll be a second opportunity right after that uh, for questions to Mr. DeMonte and Mr. Chenier about, uh, about the parks uh, issue uh, and, and impacts on city services. All those, all those sorts of things that are related to COVID, but are not necessarily the 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 health part of it. If if you follow me, so there'll be plenty of opportunity to get all those questions answered. Um, and alphabetically, we'll start with uh, with first of all with board member Elise Bannum, please. No questions for me. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, then uh, again, uh, we uh, again alphabetically we switch to council member uh, uh, Brockington. Did you call my name? I, I did. I did, uh, councillor. And Thank you, you have uh, you have five minutes. Thank you, chair. I was just being switched over. Um, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Appreciate that very much. I'll get straight to it. Uh, doctor, can you talk about vaccinating essential workers? There are communities, uh, whether it be bus drivers, uh, teachers, childcare workers, who are all public facing, who are all risking themselves. We have gone through phase one. We have identified sort of the, the oldest segments of our population and getting them either vaccinated or at least appointments. Where do we see public serving um, essential workers as far as vaccinations go. Yeah, no, thank you, Councillor. I'll, I'll start with some high-level comments and then I'll turn to Tony, who, who leads the EOC for, for vaccine ops. Um, the first thing I would say, and I think you, you acknowledged it in your question, was, was immunizing the oldest. You know, as I indicated, they, they do represent uh, um, those at highest risk of hospitalization. And, and it, it sometimes catches people by surprise that it's, it's 50 and above you know, who are at highest risk and, and are being represented in our, in our hospitals. And uh, we are making our way through that group. Um, just quickly, um, you know, we have now uh, coverage in the 90 year olds and 80 year olds of over 85%. And we've been making steady progress in recent weeks uh, for those in their 70s um, and then starting in, in their 60s as well. Um, so that's, uh, you know, making progress, as you indicated, those, you know, many of the appointments are upcoming in, in, in future weeks. Um, 
immunizing in, in phase two, the essential workers is, as you said, very, very important. Um, and I'll turn to uh, Tony, who can maybe speak to some more of the, the details of, of, uh, of the immunization for the essential workers. Thank you. So, uh, Chair, as the uh, doctors indicated, um, the uh, phase two does capture uh, what the counselors um, referring to, the patients that counselors are referring to. However, I, and I, I always have this, um, I remind everybody our um, vaccine allocation has been limited. So we are going through um, as quickly as we can with the vaccine that we do have, the priority groups in order that the province has dictated them. So I suspect for um, these individuals, it may be some time yet to before they start getting vaccinated. Thank you, uh, doctor. I won't debate with you today the merits of closing the schools. I'm firmly against this and um, decisions have been made and we have to live with that. But what are the conditions that you foresee would have to happen for schools to reopen? Yeah, so, so, if, so if the rationale for closing them was about adding additional um, um, component to the comprehensive set of interventions to bend the curve. Um, and what we've seen in our previous lockdowns um, was that that sort of recipe or suite of interventions was needed to bend this. We've also seen it in countries uh, that have had VOC fueled uh, resurgences that uh, school lockdowns and the other types of measures that the government has instituted have been successful in, in, in reversing those. Um, at Ottawa Public Health, um, I think as, as Dr. Rett just said many, many times uh, that uh, schools should be sort of the, the first to open and, and the last to close. Um, so I think in terms of this current resurgence, which is the biggest and most serious we've faced yet, um, in, the, in, in the intent of, of bending this is that we would have to presumably have been through the peak and be on the downward side. Uh, and depending on sort of where we are and what kind of transmission we're seeing, uh, but th that a minimum would need to be in place. And is, do you think that's still possible between now and the end of June? Like for schools I, to reopen or are we just in the same situation from last year where we're basically gonna be closed until the end of June and we won't think about reopening until September? I think it's really tough to, to know. It depends on, I think, how successful we are and how quickly we can bend the curve uh, and, get, and get the transmission down. Um, and, and in the meantime, vaccinating people along the way. Uh, so I, I think there'll be a few variables. I mean, I think the other thing is, is how, the variants themselves, how will they play out in terms of transmission and what that looks like? So I think there's a lot of unknowns, but I think the general principle is that we would want to see schools open as one of the first things that do, um, and but we'll have to monitor this and, and we'll happy to, to keep people updated. Thanks, Chair. I have a ton of questions. I'm going to park them all and I'll just finish with one more. If, if Mr. DeMonte could just comment on um, the aqua or the what's the right verb, the, the number of vaccines that are coming to Ottawa, what are our numbers look like recently? What are uh, short-term projections from the province? What, what's the state of vaccinations in Ottawa? So the, the state of vaccinations, it's good, uh, it is positive. Uh, in uh, Dr. Malotny's presentation, uh, he had the numbers uh, for the last couple of days. Actually, what I could report is uh, actually in Ottawa, we've administered 227,000 um, 61 doses of vaccine across, uh, so an increase of over almost quite nine, no, almost 9,000 since yesterday. So we continue to, to, to plow through, as I say, and, and the team is working hard. Um, and this is just the vaccines. I remind those that the, the city is flowing through our public health partners that we have our mass vaccine vaccination sites or the pop-up clinics that we're doing in communities. Uh, and our high-risk communities. Um, it does not include the AstraZeneca that has started to flow uh, through public health to the physicians uh, and the family health teams and or that uh, is in the pharmacy. So uh, the number is a little higher. We're now working with the province to get that so we can give a, a fulsome report and it can be on the public health site from a transparency perspective. 
So that's going well. Um, I, I must un, uh, unfortunately report that uh, we have been told that there is going to be a delay in Moderna. So we had a regular stream of getting a certain amount of Pfizer, about 25,000 doses a week. And then every second week, we get another batch of Moderna. Um, there seems to be a delay where the team is currently working on that and what that means. Um, we've always uh, here in Ottawa um, only opened bookings up when we have confirmed vaccine. But in this delay, there may be some of those bookings because they were confirmed vaccines now that we may not get them. So the team, as we speak, is uh, scrambling is not the right word, but is, is working extremely hard to try not to disrupt our flow. And so unfortunately, that's going to go down a little bit. So we are at the mercy of the vaccine we get. But I can reassure you, and, and certainly the municipal role, as we've said, put the vaccines in arms. When we get it, it goes in people's arms by the priority groups. The Dr. Matlotney explained why those priority groups have to get it first. So we're, we're continuing to move uh, quite, uh, quite quickly through the groups uh, with all the vaccine we have. And there's none at the end of the week in the fridge. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, next on the list uh, is we have uh, Councillor uh, DeRuz. Are you out there, Councillor DeRuz? There you are, George. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, yeah, it was uh, uh, I, uh, a very good. Uh, uh, very good presentation, Doctor uh, and uh, Mr. Chair. I do have a few questions. Uh, one of them is uh, we're talking about uh, the outdoor activity, Doctor. And in your in uh, your explanation, this new variant you think uh, it is really dangerous and it's spreading faster than it is. So if we are promoting outdoor activity with people and with residents, you know, people need to go outside for their mental health. And I, I understand if you look at citywide, we have some issue in some parts, but the, we have in rural areas, small parks and small individual parks that they connect community from one to another. If people are using those parks safely without interacting and just passing through, or if they see someone, if uh, should we, the messaging, let them know that they should be masking. And our messaging maybe for uh, some uh, rural area should be a little bit different than in other parks. Is that something that we should encourage? And the, because the messaging is not working in, in the city umbrella, what, what's your recommendation for that? So uh, let me give you an example from my, my bike ride on the weekend. And, and, I, and I came across a, a group of um, outside workers. There was about eight or so of them um, uh, standing around talking and and as I looked and it said well there none of them is is more than three feet away from another person uh and they were talking to each other you know into each other's faces no masks and and what I would say is that even though this is outdoors with that close proximity and it's not just brief or momentary like you're not just passing by someone but rather having a conversation that this is risky even if it's outdoors and if i'd seen that in september i would have said that's risky when i see it today it's riskier for two reasons one there's a heck of a lot more COVID around than we've ever had before several times more Secondly is, as you indicated, the variants uh, come into play here and they're more transmissible. So, I, so that to me is, is, is a concern. I think for parks, um, I think that in general, I would say you should always have a mask with you. And that, um, and I experienced this actually a couple of weeks ago in one of the parks where I was walking through there and there weren't that many people when I started, but by the time I was finishing, there was more and more people and it was becoming more challenging to pass people. Um, there was some kind of choke points, you know, at oh, across a bridge or the, and you know, the mask came out and then it came on. Um, so I think that that's wise. And, and I think we have many, many different types of parks. Um, and so I think in that kind of a situation, I, I think there needs to be a bit of judgment, but, uh, if you want to wear a mask all the time, absolutely would not argue with you. Well done. If you want to have it in your pocket and if, if there's starting to be more people around, you're having to move around them to get by past them, 
then I would suggest put the mask on. I think the, the bigger issue is around some of the amenities that sort of are a bit of a magnet, you know, for example, a play structure, you know, a bunch of parents will bring their children. So you have a bunch of children who are playing kind of together and it's tough to keep them distanced. Uh, but then you have the parents who will have a tendency to start talking to each other, which is a really natural and social thing to do. But you watch the distance get shorter and shorter because frankly, people aren't really good at the two meter distance thing thing. And it's those kinds of settings that we're thinking, you know what, uh, we're going to be highly recommending uh, a mask, if not basically making it mandatory, similar to what we did in the winter, um, you know, where we saw a lot of congregating and crowding around uh, rinks, for example. And so we said, you know, while you're waiting to go on the rink, or if you're watching, you need to distance and wear a mask. So that's what we're, we're considering right now. Thank you, doctor. This is very helpful. I really appreciate it. That's from the outdoor perspective. I, I know common sense sometimes has to prevail and people have to uh, judge every situation and every situation in different. I have a, a question, probably you can answer or not, but I do want to bring a comment uh, to you. Uh, we do have an agricultural sector in our community. So we have uh, mushroom farms and we have a dairy farm and things like that. Do you be able anytime soon to to, to maybe we address if they can, uh, if they can provide uh, a, a health, uh, a health nurse or somebody to administrate vaccination to be able to vaccinate this sector. I have a, I have a, in my area, few farm and few, they have like 200 employee and there are from everywhere in the city. They're from the K1V, K2, uh, K2V, every area. Uh, are we going to be able to address some of those? We do this with vaccination for the flu. I'm hoping that this we don't forget that sector and try to concentrate on those worker and uh, those uh, businesses so we can send someone and they can inject and they can provide a doctor on site or nurses on site. I would love it if I can uh, address and advocate for those people for you to be able to uh, don't forget those sectors. Yeah, no, thank you for that question. And, and certainly, um, and I'm going to turn it to Tony in terms of the ops piece here uh, shortly. Um, you know, I think we saw that with the max vaccination clinics, for example, in the city, that we knew that that may be a barrier or may be challenging for people living in more outlying rural areas to, to access those. And so that's why we've had sort of rural pop-ups uh, included in, in the strategy. I, I think workplaces at, at this point where we're immunizing, you know, 16 above uh, in high priority neighborhoods, neighborhoods 15 above. I think workplaces can serve a, an interesting role in, in an area to, as a hub to help people who are meeting those age thresholds to be able to access it. I think down the road when we have more vaccine available to us, there'll be other things that we can do as well. But uh, I'll turn to Tony in terms of anything else that, that you'd like to add around the, the workplace angle. Yeah, and thank you, Chair. Um, and the doctor is absolutely right, Councillor. The uh, the strategy is that is part of our strategy later on. Uh, it is unfortunately, as the doctor said, very much vaccine dependent. But we do have a workplace uh, inoculation strategy. Uh, you're talking about farm workers, but there are other big industries too that that strategy could be very uh, valid to uh, get through a lot of people, the Amazons of the world, that type of thing. So it's part of our our team's. Um, uh, a plan and we have it, but it's going to be very vaccine dependent. And when we get to that stage, but absolutely we'll be reaching out when, uh, when we're there. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I'm, I just want to take a one moment to, uh, I know that you guys have been doing an amazing job. Uh, Mr. Chair, those rural pop up, uh, we got so many positive feedback. I shared some with them with you. I don't think we say enough. Thank you for our frontline worker, for our OPH, and of course our uh, Tony DeMonte and his team from the Protect, uh, Community Protective Service. I just want to make sure to let you know that those been well received. And I'm hoping my next question, probably Tony is going to probably ask, say yes, but I will throw it out there. Are we going to have, and then when we have vaccine available, are we planning on doing a second round? And I know that some people received their first shot, but they are in, they don't know where the second shot's going to come from. Can you just uh, uh, give give us some direction on that point? Sure, sure. As as you are aware, in, in uh, across Canada, we're we're now using the four month uh, delay between shots. So the 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 short term, the, ten, the 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 team is concentrating on issues that you've just raised and other issues 
to try to get to the right populations to get their first shot. And then when we do the second round, um, what seems to be the, um, the common uh, thread now that we're looking at is we'd like to mirror what we did in the first round. So rinse, repeat, so do the same model that we did initially. Um, that said, um, we're four months away from that. And it is possible if we have very significant amounts of vaccine, we can accelerate by doing other models. So I don't wanna um, lock us into doing that. Uh, if we don't have to, we may have other uh, other strategies, but certainly we will be looking at that and the team is quite aware that that's a, a need that we'll have to do. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much for giving the opportunity to ask this question. Thank you, Dr. Maloney. And I know the Vera is not here, but her work and effort has been amazing in our city. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you for your kind words for the frontline people and, and also for highlighting through Tony um, you know, the issue that comes up repeatedly, it's supply, supply, supply. Uh, I, I can tell you from meeting with OPH and meeting with Tony's group regularly, the, the city is prepared to ramp up. City is prepared to get more vaccines and the more arms and in more different ways, but we just, we need that supply. So it's when it comes, um, and it, you know, Tony can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think he will, is when it comes, we can hit the ground running. And, and get it into people's arms. Um, next, uh, we have uh, uh, Councillor Deans, please. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I can't turn my video on because I've been blocked, so uh, I'll just continue anyway. Um, my first question, I guess I use it just a personal circumstance to illustrate the, the question. And, um, and that, that question is, um, for myself, I, have had, I haven't had a vaccine yet, but I am on a list to get one. And I have had three different channels that I could use, take to get a vaccine. I chose to book one through the mass booking system and wait my turn. And I haven't accepted the other potential avenues that I had available to me because I didn't want to block other people from being in line to get their vaccine. But I just heard Mr. DeMonte say that Moderna vaccines may be delayed and we may not be able to provide the vaccines to people that are on lists. So that actually concerns me. I'm sure it concerns a lot of people. So I guess in terms of a strategy, uh, you know, what are you saying to people that uh, heard what Mr. DeMonte had to say today and are concerned that, you know, um, they, haven't, they haven't blocked other appointments off um, to take the first one that came available to them because they're trying to share, but, they may that way end up getting knocked out of their their turn in the line. I, actually, if I, I'm, I'll start. Like we seem to be setting this up as a as a pattern, and I'll turn it over to Tony. Um, so uh, this is going to increasingly occur as we increase channels. I mean, I think there'll be opportunities for people to be eligible in uh, under multiple reasons. So, for example, I was speaking to a group of of seniors. Um, and, and they were really, really, um, interested in their health conditions and whether that would make them eligible in phase two. And eventually I said, you know, how old are you? I mean, you know, if you don't mind, because you know, would you happen to be over 60? And they said, oh, well, yes. And they were 70 and eight. And I said, you're eligible now. It, you know, it doesn't actually matter about your health conditions, really, from an eligibility standpoint, you're eligible now, and this is how you get your vaccine. So I think, um, many people will have fortunately, different ways they can get it. And my advice would be get the first one that you can. Uh, but Tony can, can you know, talk about, you know, some of the, because I think underlying your question was, was concerns about supply later on uh, in yeah. the month. So um, Chair, uh, to Councillor Deans, uh, I, I completely concur with the doctor, take the first uh, one you have, and, and I'm aware that you have several channels. Um, this information uh, came to us uh, the last day, so the team is now working on it. I've repeated to, to tell people that if you've got a booked vaccine, it's because we had vaccine confirmed by the province. Um, this little glitch that we have today that we've just been uh, made aware of is the Moderna was part of the confirmed batch. So now we have a bit of a gap. There are options being proposed to us by the province for other vaccine that may become available to fill that gap. 
So I, I don't want people to panic right now. If you have a vaccine, uh, rather an appointment and it's booked, um, I suspect we'll have a solution for uh, this problem now that the province has presented us with uh, again. And uh, so uh, I just want to send that reassuring message that the team is currently working on finding a solution to this gap that we have that was just presented to us. I just want to understand the message clearly when you say take the first one you can get. So I'm on a list to get probably Pfizer and Moderna through the max mass vaccination clinic. I could probably get an AstraZeneca through a drugstore as soon or sooner. Uh, so am I, should I be booking that as well? That's what, that, this is the question. I just wanna make sure that what I do, I, now I have two spots booked, I'm gonna take the first one I can get, but should I book two or should I just book one? so that it doesn't block somebody else from booking that spot. Brenda, I'll, I think I can take that. So uh, thank you for that clarification. No, you, you should just book one, but um, as the doctor said, take the first one that you can get as quickly as possible. So if that was AstraZeneca in a pharmacy and you can get it tomorrow morning, I would recommend take that and not go and tell the public, don't go book now in a mass vaccination site in a, in a week because while you're not blocking, you won't show up at that or you could cancel it you won't show up that vaccine won't be lost we can assure you we have processes for that for people who you know the few people a day that don't show up uh, those vaccines are not lost and they're given to the to priority groups so thank you for that clarification i would say as a doctor take the first vaccine take the one you can get as quickly as possible and get some protection okay um second question has to do with uh, uh indication of trends uh I think we're all very, very concerned about the rapid rise uh, in positivity in our community and across the province. Um, I, you know, it seems to me that as we've gone through this in the past year, there have been um, indicators of where those trend lines are going. And one of them was through the sewage. And I, I mean, I heard this week that there was sort of some positive signs in the Ottawa sewage system um, regarding where our trend line is going. So is there some you know, silver lining here in the potential that these numbers are gonna start going down and not continue to rise? Yeah, no, it, you know, interesting question because, you know, as I said earlier, the hospitalizations is, 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 a, is a trustworthy measure, but it lags. Like by the time it's signaling a problem, it, it's, it's a little bit too late because it's just going to keep rising for a while. Um, the, the, the wastewater or sewage has been a, um, a, a useful piece of information this year. It's, it's been novel, so there's not a lot of experience with it. Um, there were some challenges through the spring where it was fluctuating a fair bit. Um, maybe runoff, maybe differences in salinity, various things with this, with the spring. Um, it's also showing some fluctuation right now. So very, very high, 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 and then suddenly downwards. So it's frankly difficult to interpret, uh, in terms of what it means. And I think since all of the other indicators are signaling serious situation, I, I think we, you know, we're going to we need to treat this as a serious situation because time is of the essence in terms of the hospitalization trend. Um, if in the future weeks, uh, you know, that signals down, then the reported cases should come down, then, you know, we'll begin to feel, you know, more comfortable, I think. But at this point, I wouldn't, you know, to use the old expression, hang my hat on, on, you know, that fluctuating and this day it's down and the other days, I, I think we're just keeping an eye on it. But the worry is, you know, the number of cases we're seeing, the positivity rate and the hospitalizations, and they're all flashing. We have a big problem. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and Dr. Malachny, you also uh, mentioned by this weekend that we would probably see a section 22 relating to parks, but you didn't give us any indication what that really is about or what that would look like. And I'm just, I'm interested, and I'm also interested just as a member of council in what I can do as a member of council and what we collectively as, as council um, can do um, to, to provide messaging, I think, in our parks. I know I have some parks where, you know, people are congregating, well, they're parks, and, you know, um, 
and we want people in our park. So I just want to know what the Section 22 is about and have we, either public health or the city, developed any signage that we could have to put up in our parks, reminding people of good public health practices, masking, hand washing, social distancing, all of those things. Like, do we have some form of reminder campaign or education campaign just to reinforce the messages if you're in the park? There are times, you said it yourself, Dr. Malachny, that um, you know people get a little bit close together. So those reminders are always important. So have we done, do we have any materials? Do we have any signage? And what's that section 22 going to look like? Right. So the um, um, so in terms of what we're looking at for the section 22, we're still working through the details, uh, which is why I haven't sort of put it in, in front of you right right now. Um, is, is the idea similar to what we had for the winter that for for some venues that there would be capacity limits to avoid crowding? And these are areas that have had um, significant amounts of, of crowding and complaints and bylaw calls, that sort of thing. Um, things, you know, the places that are, that we're, we're talking about are basketball courts and skate parks are the two that come right up to the, to the top in terms we've had issues with, um, the crowding there. And then in the perimeter, similar to what we had with the rinks, people, you know, either waiting to get on the court or just watching and, and a fair bit of crowding. Um, so we're looking at, you know, which amenities that, uh, you know, are we going to have capacity limits? So, and then which amenities then as well that to use them, that you will be required to wear a mask as well as if you're in the, in the, uh, in the periphery. Um, but, you know, as I was explaining to the other counselor, you know, depending on which park and what time you might be walking through, there may not be other people around. And so I think in that situation, I think at this point, at least um, to have discretion that just we'd be recommending, you know, you should have your mask with you. And if, if there's starting to be more people around you, then, then please put that on. Uh, in terms of signage, absolutely. This is something that uh, RCFS, uh, the recreation uh, leads, the operators, that they are going to be uh, developing signage. And of course, um, our, our media and the city media will be putting out messaging uh, to the public. Uh, and, and any Section 22 we've done in the past, we post it on our website as well for reference. So when could we expect to get some signage? Because I know I've you know, had some concerns expressed about crowding in some of the parks. And I just like to be, you know, maybe a little more of a carrot than a stick. But I, I just think, you know, if people are reminded it's right there, it says wear a mask, you know, avoid, you know, being too close, all of those things. I think they're all important reminders in our park. So I'd like to get some of that up as soon as possible. What's the time frame on that? Counselor, I, I, uh, maybe I can help with that. Uh, yep. As Dr. Malachny um, just spoke, um, our signs are likely, much like the virus, to have variants to them. Um, we are, and, and we are, in, in fact, waiting a little bit to, to see what the where we are going to land in terms of capacities, because we will likely have signs for basketball courts, and there may be a capacity, a masking, and a distancing requirement. Uh, we may have a different sign for sports fields or for uh, various amenities, playground areas of the park. So we're just waiting to, when that lands, we have uh, what we've been working on is um, some mock-ups uh, using some of the signage that we and the language that we used uh, last summer, uh, but getting ready to adapt it and to include, of course, the masking requirements. Uh, both mandatory and in some cases highly recommended. And um, as soon as we have uh, the, you know, we, we know where all of that is going to land, then we're probably a couple of days away from producing the signs and then deploy the, deploying them uh, out to the parks. And much like last year, we'll use a priority of the biggest sites first and, and move on to there to neighborhood parks and, and such. Thank you, Dan. Uh, that, that question put you past your five up, minutes, Councillor. Can I follow up on the section 22? I just wondered if members of council are going to be consulted on which um, uh, facilities are going to be added into that section 22. Um, if that'll have to be the last question though, but Brent, over to you. 
Yeah, no. Um, I, I mean, I think we're we're going to base it on on uh, predominantly what uh, you know bylaw enforcement and other s- city workers and recreation and what they're seeing across all of their venues, uh, and and then as well. I mean, what we assess at OPH as as risky situations. Um, so I think we're going to start with. Um, you know, ones that are, are sort of the most obvious and of, of most concern and uh, um, get that out as quickly as we can for this weekend. And then I think we're going to be able to, one of the things but with, with, with the Section 22 is it's fairly easy to update uh, and, and make to tweaks as needed based on, you know, because other venues are going to open. Uh, as the weather warms up, uh, others may be used in ways that they're not being used now. Uh, so I think we're going to start in a fairly focused way and then uh, learn from experience in terms of uh, what the public is, is doing in, in parks and, and where we can have uh, the most impact. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. And, and just, a, just a quick comment before we go to the next one. Uh, Diane, I had a similar dilemma as you. Uh, I, I got a call from a pharmacy saying, uh, can you come in this afternoon? you're on the list. Uh, I immediately talked to Dr. Etches and Dr. Etches said, is there any reason you're not on the list? I said, no, I, I qualify age wise. And she said, do it, do it, do it. Do not hesitate. Take the first opportunity available to you. And to your comment about what can counselors do. And she said, you tweet it, you Facebook it, you tell everybody about it. And, and that's, that's what you do. So that's my non-medical advice. Um, to you, but uh, she was very strong, very strong about that. Said everybody should take to protect the people around them and themselves. Everybody should take the first shot that's that's available to them. Uh, Councillor Dudas, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Doctor, for your for your presentation. I'm going to be incredibly brief. I know there's many people with questions. I have had several residents in my community, as well as some family members, who jumped uh, immediately when when the phone lines opened and received their appointments through OPH early on in the vaccination process. Um, Because of the booking errors with the provincial system, their second doses were not rebooked and they were told that they would get information back. Now they're starting to see their family members who are younger get their first doses and they're hearing that in places like Mississauga, they're getting, you know, 80 and plus, they're getting second doses. So I'm just, I'm looking for clarity that I can pass along to my constituents in terms of what is the process? How will they find out? Where are they on the priority in terms of those who are 80 and plus who were supposed to receive their second dose but have not had that confirmation yet? So maybe I can uh, help out with that. So yes, as as you mentioned, uh, Chair, as the Councillor mentioned, we had uh, jumped ahead of the queue. We weren't waiting for the provincial system to get work out its bugs. And our call taking center of public health received so that she got their first dose through that. They will get uh, um, call, a call back when it's time for to book a second dose. Um, we've worked with it and hopefully it will be on the provincial system. Right now, the provincial system does not allow you to book just a second dose. They are aware of this and they are uh, attempting to correct it. Um, And when they do and it's available, this individual will then be able to go on the provincial booking system, enter their name and get their second dose scheduled. And again, it's still in that four month uh, timeline. I know there's some exceptions going on um, in uh, in Peel for other things. We had also second doses given to our long term care residents and our retirement homes. They were priority. So for this individual, if they got it, their first dose, their second dose, they will be able to get it in the time frame. But um, public health will call them to tell them, yes, now the provincial booking system allows you to go to go on. And it's a good question because many people are asking us the same question. So uh, um, now we've, we've got it out there. Thank you. Wonderful. And as I said, I was brief. So I'm just going to thank uh, all of OPH, all of our public health nurses, all the frontline who are administering the vaccine and who are out there every day, as well as city staff who are dealing with all this. So and thank you, Chair Eglin. As well too. Uh, and, and just a quick follow up. Um, I'm just getting uh, some uh, some some feed uh, from 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 our staff. So just a small clarification. Um, OPH won't be calling the individuals, but when it's that time, because we know when they were immunized, we will be flooding the communication channels to say we're now ready for you to for your second dose, and this is what you do. Um, there's also an email. 
um, feed that you can sign up for on our website. If, if one is so inclined, um, my elderly relatives, uh, they don't use email. Uh, so, so they usually depend on other family members, but if they're so inclined, there's an email feed that will give updates as well. So we'll be uh, putting the information out through multiple channels when it's for time. Thank you very much, Dr. I'll pass that along. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is, is Councillor and Board Member uh, Eli El Shantiri. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to try to see. Okay, it's working. Thank you very much, Mr. Yeah, Chair. We'll see you just fine. Thank you. Uh, question may be more or less for uh, Tony, and maybe Dr. Brand can step in. So, uh, uh, Mr. Dumonte, we had uh, the rural pop ups in the, you know, all around the rural wards is there's and we talk about this in the past is the and i know it's all about the, the vaccine and the availability but uh, and we see the success of those pop-ups and it makes a big you know, big difference to the resident who live far away and we don't have public transportation and be able to show up in their own community uh, without the stress of the parking and and, and other is there's a is is there some idea it's going to happen again? And if do you know when, with, at which age group you think that will happen? And it's not just for Ward 5. Just to be fair, I'm asking as a chair of the Agricultural Welfare Committee, been asked by my colleague, George and Scott. So uh, two things. When we initially identified, because of the large geography Ottawa has, it was an imperative uh, that we had to get out to the rural communities and, and go through those communities. And as you say, uh, Councillor, it's been a, a successful uh, run. Um, the at that time, uh, I want to remind you, we had the uh, physician route was not available, so the family health teams, health links out in the west and the west end, and others uh, now are going to start seeing vaccine as well. So they're going to be going to see their clients that way, as well as uh, pharmacies. And there's been expanded pharmacies. Uh, uh, and we believe they'll be continuing. So there's two other methods for people that don't have to go to a, a mass vaccination clinic, although that's still available for them. As I indicated earlier to Councillor DeRuz, we are planning at looking at a mirror image when we get to second doses to go back and do everybody's second doses. So that'll be an opportunity, but that's second doses. Not, and I think you're referring to first doses. Right now with the, the limited capacity and the next groups that we have to do, um, that was very labor intensive for us, but very important. But we are using that uh, our, our human resources now to target the high risk uh, neighborhoods. And so they've, they've now been deployed there. So um, I think we're, we're not likely coming back quickly, but I would just say there's mass vaccination sites, but you're right. And there's some transportation op opportunities for people. There's pharmacies and the um, physicians. Now the physician groups and more of the family health teams and health links are now going to start seeing vaccines. So a lot of those clients will be done that way. And then finally, because um, uh, I know Dr. Malotny would remind me of this, because um, Vera does all the time, we understand there are some very high risk homebound individuals that um, can't get out to, and those options are not available. We are working now with, uh, with the uh, health providers that provide them care. And we may have a small, small team that goes and does the, do those one-off uh, patients that require uh, help. So uh, that's kind of broadly the, the answer. And I don't know, if, Brent, if you have anything else you want to add. No, I think you covered it very well. I mean, so, yeah, sorry, go ahead, Councillor. No, I was just going to say, uh, Mr. Diamante, and I know uh, the, the pharmacist, it seems like it's more, I don't know if it's a political or if it's uh, whatever. Uh, we have submitted some pharmacists who would like to offer this, and we worked with them in the past, and they help us through the, the flu shots, but then they were excluded from that list. So what do we have to do to, to because they help us. Those, those pharmacies in the rural area, they prevent, you know, they're helping people so they don't have to drive all the way to the city hall or to Canada or, or somewhere else. So I can, I can assure you, you're correct. We provided what we, the public health team has been advocating and we identified all the, the pharmacies that we thought and geographically dispersed to cover really well our, our community across Ottawa and particularly our rural communities. That was provided in the first draft. Um, not all of them, as you say, were, were given uh, 
um, the first OK. There have been some that additional ones that have been added recently. And I know public health is advocating to continue to add some. So that work is continuing, Councillor. I believe that we'll see uh, as we get more um, more vaccine available, particularly AstraZeneca, that they'll open up more channels and you'll see more pharmacies add on. And the one, and I, I'm, I know, cause I'm well aware of the, uh, the ones you're referring to, they are on the list of those that we continue to advocate. So I hope like you, that the province then, uh, they have to sign individual agreements and it's at a provincial level that's done. So, but I, I would suspect that they will be coming uh, in the near future, hopefully. Thank you. And if I have time, I'd like to follow up on the home bound, uh, individuals who have no place to go or no, you know, no ability to go anywhere, and we have the community per medicine. Can that work out between public health and, and, and the per medicine in the community? I, I would imagine, I heard from Dr. Aches before, that about 2,000 crossed the city. So 2,000 out of a million population, uh, I'm sure it could be manageable. I, I can't see too many, uh, in each ward, but I mean, is, what would you do to them? They yeah. can't be just left behind. So no, they won't be left behind. And, and I'll let Dr. Malotny talk about the, the hierarchy of risks. I mean, I, I know these are people have challenges and they're at home, but in, in theory, they're, they're less at risk right now, but I'll, I'll leave that to Dr. Malotny to explain why in the hierarchy. But to, to your point about community paramedics, you're right, as I was mentioning earlier, they went out and did the rurals. Now they're in the high risk communities and we're also using them uh, to do um, the dilution of the, um, of the um, vaccines in the, in the mass vaccination clinic. So, you know, it's, it's really a human resource challenge. So, uh, but we're looking at other options. So um, I, I can assure you, Councillor, that we're not gonna leave those people behind. We know they're important, but right now in the hierarchy of risk, uh, and I'll, I'll let Brent talk to that, um, that because they're at home and, and they're less exposed, um, not that, you know, they don't need a vaccine, they need one. They're, they're not being bumped, but the human resources we have are focusing on, on high risk communities where people are, are, are in more contact. That's part of the strategy right now. Yeah, no, Tony, that, that, that's, that's right. I mean, the other thing I would add is that the, um, the individuals who um, get um, home care, uh, on, a, on an ongoing basis um, have been prioritized uh, higher. And so the, the home visiting capacity is, go, is doing those earlier because that in the provincial framework, they're at a higher priority. And, and once uh, that group is completed, then I think it will also provide additional um, um, well, experience, but also capacity um, to, uh, to deal with other homebound individuals who are not uh, uh, receiving home care on an ongoing basis. Hey, thank you very much. And uh, uh, again, Dr. Brent, remember, uh, yeah, maybe they are at home and they're, you know, uh, the risk for them may be limited, but still the home care or, or the people who come in to deliver their meals or help them out, they're at risk. So, I mean, uh, and I don't want to bring back another issue, and you know about it, uh, Dr. Brent, uh, doctors do not do visits in the rural area, especially if it's far enough from the hospital or from their practice. So we don't get that luxury, have a doctor to go to those, uh, to those uh, residents. Yeah, no, I, and that's what I was meaning by the, 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 the individuals who receive home care. And so that could be a personal service worker, it might be a nurse, a physio, yes. some, there's different types of home care, right? So it's those individuals that, that uh, we're working with uh, uh, Ontario Health and, and the, uh, the home care providers to, to work through and get them uh, immunized. And so if they're a home care recipient, they're prioritized. Thank you very much, uh, both of you. And thank you, Mr. Chair, that's my question. Thank you, Councillor. Um, uh, next up is uh, Councillor Fleury for his five minutes. Afternoon, Matt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you very much, Chair. Tony and your team. We wouldn't be here talking if you had two million doses in the fridge. We start to understand where are the obstacles and the barriers. We did prioritize at first people in shelters. There's one group that are in the shelters are the families. 
and there are not being vaccine. They haven't been vaccine yet. What's what can we do? When we establish a priority in the province and also locally, we will get there. We, I, you're you're right. It's a question of uh, the volume of doses available. Mm -hmm. Chloe is asking me, we have um, uh, many families in, uh, in situations that are in, uh, in, uh, in um, uh, shelters and motels, shelters, et cetera. So, uh, and I know they're a priority for us and uh, we have a vaccine challenge, but it's also on the hierarchy of, of lists. And I don't want to necessarily talk to that because we're following the provincial um, list, but uh, we can do some uh, adaptations locally, but I, I can leave it to you maybe to explain that for him. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that uh, earlier on in this uh, in this pandemic, when we were, you know, seeing outbreaks in in many, many shelters uh, in the city, um, you know, it was prioritized with inner city health to to be able to to get in and immunize. Uh, and it's and it's, it's certainly made a difference. Um, the the family sort of shelters and yes there are uh, families in in uh, in in hotels and various other other sites those fall under sort of congregate living um, uh, group and and certainly they're in in phase two uh, and again it's it's a supply issue uh, and uh, you know as soon as we have some more vaccine supplies that uh, we very much look forward to being able to get in there and. Uh, and be able to immunize various congregate settings, including the ones that uh, were described. We, we've seen the, the issues of the K2V and the pharmacy uh, distribution uh, here locally. I haven't heard community health centers, and at some point in different parts of our OPH conferences, you, we did speak to doctors mm -hmm. and community health centers. Could you maybe give us the context of when they'll be getting um, vaccines to mm -hmm. distribute as well? Tony, that was a, it was a question around the CHCs and, and when they are. I mean, I do know that there's contracts and, and you know, being established uh, with various primary care in order to be able to uh, provide them vaccine. Uh, but maybe you'll have more. Yeah, details. So, yeah thank you, Brent. So, um, uh, Chair, the, it, we uh, received our first batch of 11,000 AstraZeneca doses that flow through public health. So there's the pharmacies that get their AstraZeneca direct from the province. And then there's public health that receives AstraZeneca and we have 11,000 doses. Um, currently, uh, the public health team uh, is uh, signing individual contracts with the, the different CHCs um, and um, they, are, they will be distributed throughout. I think um, we've now got somewhere in the neighborhood or six or 7,000 of those doses already accounted for. So some CHCs have already signed these contracts and um, I, I had mentioned at our last, um, our last briefing, um, we have to give them a bit of time to, to ramp up. So, um, and I know it's a little technical, but you know, the, um, the IT solution, even for the doctors and their teams have to be trained on it. Cause when they give a vaccine, they've got to load it up into this provincial IT. So, so that work is all being done. The, the uh, contracts are signed with uh, many of them and that work is continuing, um, uh, Dr. Arneson uh, out of public health is leading that for us. And so that that's moving quickly. So I think you'll start seeing directly some CHC starting to do that work and the broader group uh, come on. And then the AstraZeneca that's going to flow from uh, the province to the public health unit is targeting that uh, in particular, that group as their first priority. Yeah, yeah, Tony. If I could just add one thing, so actually, Dr. Arneson just just reminded me that um, um, for the CHCs, they're doing a lot of the outreach type immunization. So for those homebound chronic home care patients, they're helping out there. They're also helping out with a lot of the neighborhood outreach. Um, they they actually were helping, you know, very early on last fall in terms of testing. Uh, and outreach and engagement around that. And they continue to do that, but they're also leveraging that experience that they have with the community uh, to, for the, the neighborhood uh, pop-ups that are occurring and other focus initiatives. Um, on a que les résidents 50 à 59 ans... We announced really recently that resident aged 50 to 59 were identified by OPH 
to call a certain number to register. Some residents were unable to get an appointment. So among the priority wards, how can they register if they can't get hold? So they can't get a spot because they're not in the right age group? Because if they are in the right age range and in the right wards, so Ottawa Public Health has identified 21 specific wards. It will be a pleasure for me to talk to you later on today. They should be able to get an appointment. pop-ups sometimes they're not within the same postal code or, or in the vicinity can you maybe share some of the thoughts around pop-ups and proximity to the identified priority neighborhoods so maybe i'll, I'll start a, on the logistics side of the pop-ups and the strategy that was identified and then maybe dr malotny can talk you know more broadly from a clinical perspective how he sees that so um, as we identified the 21 neighborhoods, as you remember, we, we found some physical infrastructure in some of those neighborhoods, small community centers. These are not mass vaccination clinics. It's not to put 2,000 people a day through there. It's a couple of hundred people. So, and we wanted to get as close to those neighborhoods as possible. In some cases that worked well. Uh, in other cases, there were little or, or none. And um, now we've moved on to a phase where it's become part of our um, standard um, operating uh, procedure for um, for those neighborhoods and we're trying to put pop-ups that can within a few kilometers serve a couple of neighborhoods so that's the one thing and I, and I know that's not a perfect solution for some people and then as you know counselor we started um, last weekend on an even a newer concept that uh, the team uh, very innovative that came up with uh, the micro pop-ups and I know we're using these names because we're making up as we go along but these micro pop-ups literally are going into, uh, they do outreach first, they get consents, and they literally are going into buildings and knocking on doors. So it's like even, even more, um, we're focusing in more, I guess okay. is the way to describe it. So um, that is our next strategy. And I think it'll fill the gap that you're identifying uh, because we're trying to do the balance. You've got the mass vaccination clinics. Then we've got these 21 neighborhoods where we're doing these pop-ups where several people can get to like one building, but it may be a couple of kilometers away. And then we're going to do the micro pop-ups rather that can focus in on different buildings. So um, the team is experimenting a little. And I would suggest that uh, I think um, I know that the results in the debrief we got from last weekend of the micro pop was very, very successful. Uh, and it's, it's a great tool. So I think that's going to resolve as we go forward the gap that you're, you're identifying for us. Okay. Yeah, and that's certainly exciting for, uh, for Ottawa Community Housing. And I know there's ongoing conversation with your teams and public health on some of those homebound efforts. So uh, that would conclude uh, my questions, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the clarifications. Thank yeah. you. Thing. And if uh, I could just add, Chair, just one thing in terms of the um, uh, all these options, and 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 they they ch they do change, um, and and pro the province will then sort of change things. So the most update information is on our website uh, because you know we continue to make improvements and and, and offer new things. So so the most updated information is on our vaccine uh, website. Uh, and, and to add to that, uh, Dr. Course, there's the city service that you can sign up for as well that will send you uh, a message uh, when there are updates through, through Tony's group in terms of, of vaccine developments and, and changes in, uh, in uh, eligibility. So that, that's another, another avenue that people can stay up to date quite quickly. Um, uh, Member Gower, or Councillor Gower. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I have a couple couple subjects I wanted to ask about. Um, first one, I guess, for Dr. Malachny, I'm a little bit concerned that people might be missing part of the message. We've been focusing so much this week on large gatherings at parks or house parties. And I'm still, if I were to walk down a, a suburban street out here on a Saturday night, um, certainly can hear what sounds like a lot of families getting together or friends getting together. What is your advice? Is there a safe way or should people be getting together for with another family or friend for a barbecue or, you know, sitting in lawn chairs in the in the front driveway? What what kind of advice would you give to people who are thinking about 
their plans for this weekend, for example? Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for that question. And, and um, I'm going to use a phrase that I've needed to use a fair bit during this pandemic is that there's a difference between what's allowed and what's a good idea. Um, and, you know, under the um, stay at home order, uh, you are allowed legally to have gatherings of up to five people. Um, but frankly, you know, we are under a stay at home order and, and to really bend this curve, like we think back to my presentation, uh, we actually have a significant problem here, right? Facing us, we need to push the transmission down. And really that means staying with our families, uh, and our households. And, um, you know, in terms of, of interacting with, with our friends or extended family, I'd say the safest thing is to do it socially or virtually. Um, I'm sorry, virtually. Um, it's sort of less uh, 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 desirable is, is to try and meet with people and maintain distance, wear masks, but there's still that, that sort of risk that, you know, the distancing will go down or you're going to eat and drinking, which means you take masks off and that all adds to, to the risk over time. I mean, we really are faced right now with needing to bend this curve. Um, and, and, and that, um, staying with our households is really what we need to be doing. And, and just to clarify, I mean, my, my comment on the five people, that's an outdoor gathering there. You're not allowed to have, a, you know, any indoors. And of course it wouldn't be wise from a public health perspective to be having people from outside your household coming in because that's even riskier. Uh, but, but certainly, I mean, that, that'd be my best advice right now is, is that we really need to stay with our households and push the transmission down because the more contacts we have, the more opportunities for transmission there are. Thank you. And I guess the other one is around this hotspot postal code issue. And just for clarity, um, I'm looking for some a comment on in uh, the provincial selection of hotspots. First of all, the selection. And second, around the decision making for um, vaccine availability or vaccine vaccination strategy within these hotspots. Is it the province who's making these decisions unilaterally, or is it in conjunction with OPH? Or I just, I'm really still confused about the level of responsibility. Who's responsible for the vaccine strategy around these hotspots? Yeah, so so the, the these FSAs, which are forward sortation areas, so it's it's, it's the first three digits of your postal code, um, and it's used to to plan mail delivery. Um, the province has used it because they have that sort of data for every uh, part of the province to to identify areas. Um, and, and certainly we're engaged with the ministry talking about what would work best for Ottawa. And, and um, we, from the very beginning, identified the high priority neighborhoods. And we, as, as uh, we said earlier, I mean, we started vaccinating in them even before the provincial um, uh, booking system was up. And in terms of, of our outreach efforts, they are on the 21 uh, high priority neighborhoods, you know, uh, uh, Tony uh, DeMonte was just talking about the, the pop-ups and the micro pop-ups. That's what we're doing. Uh, that's what people uh, can book through us, uh, through our uh, phone number, uh, since it's a separate booking system. Uh, in terms of overlap, um, some of our hot, some of our priority uh, neighborhoods overlap with the hotspots, but uh, the neighborhoods um, are, are sort of finer grain uh, areas, and that's what we're using to to prioritize neighborhoods and to do our outreach efforts. Okay, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Council. I, and I just add that, you know, I think Brent said it quite well that that. There can be some overlap, but our 21 areas are not necessarily the areas that the province chose. And I think that's what, what you're referring to, but, but our focus is on the 21 areas that, that we have identified or OPH has identified as, as, as needing extra attention at this point. Um, next, uh, Councillor Harder, if you're still on the line. Yes, I am, hello. Hi everyone. Um, so I'm actually going to ask a question on behalf of Carol Ann Mian and myself because uh, she's an M and who knows when or if you'll even get to her today. She, as she said, um, we want to know how you identify uh, the high risk clusters. We've had high numbers in Barhaven for 
well, since the beginning. Um, and we also have a ton of kids um, and, and, you know, university age, way older high school, et cetera. And we want to know what, in fact, do you uh, use to determine um, what, a, what uh, would um, necessitate uh, a pop-up and what, does, what, how do you get to the top of the list or the, I mean, who wants to be on the high risk list? It's not like we want to, but we have a large number. Uh, we also are hearing complaints from people um, about the um, priority uh, with the kids being a, you know, trans, transmitters, if you will. Um, what about uh, the vaccination for them? Uh, so how do you, um, how do you get to be a high risk cluster? And why aren't we? Is it socioeconomic? Is that is that the main factor from the city of Ottawa's perspective? So I'll, I'll start. Um, so thank you for that question. So so with respect to the identification of of, of the high priority neighborhoods, um, it, it, there's really two major parts to that. Uh, the first is is the the observed number of of rates. Uh, the rate and the number of cases per, per population compared to other areas of the city. Uh, we also do include the socioeconomic status uh, information from uh, the Ottawa neighborhood study, um, which also goes into, into the prioritization. Um, and so the, uh, those are used to, to, to rank uh, the neighborhoods, uh, the, which are the high priority neighborhoods oh. for, for See, the so, so thank you for that. And so that's, tells me that it's very likely that no matter, you know, how many more we get, we're never going to reach the top of that list. But I had thought that uh, because we had prioritized so many communities in the beginning that we were doing, uh, we were very proactively as a city going in there, it should be time now to turn into the, uh, uh, the large suburban communities where we have high numbers. Um, it also, uh, and, and, and I, I just, I hope that we never have a chance if we need it, because you know we're a, a community that has a high household income, and uh, you know, and it's just that way. So, what would it take to trigger it? A, a mass, a mass, a in, massive increase? Like we have is three hundred and fifty cases just in North Bar Haven a lot? So as I said, I mean our our epi. Uh, group, I mean, they will look at the number of cases per population and, and, and rank the, uh, uh, the neighborhoods according. And, and initially we had a, a few, uh, we're now at 21. Um, we hope to add additional neighborhoods, um, over time. Um, but certainly the, uh, um, the, the number of cases is, 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 is the important piece here. Um, the other thing I would point out, though, is, is that right now, in terms of what needs to happen in the upcoming weeks, is really about prevention uh, and not vaccine. I mean, in terms of those preventive behaviors are absolutely critical. And I think we all have uh, a, a task or responsibility to be really using all of our channels to be Can emphasizing. Can I just interrupt, please, prevention. because I don't want to waste my, my five minutes here. and. I have a question based on what you were just saying there. Um, you it's know, we're hearing five a lot minutes, of, Jan. We don't count the we don't count the time for answers. So, okay. don't worry. Don't okay. worry about that. All right. Um, so, with regard to the, um, for example, the uh, the bylaw officers and now the park ambassadors, I am absolutely blown away by the fact that bylaw officers have still not made the list to get immunized it as apps and and i think potentially it's because the province because they're so far removed from the type of business that we're in they don't understand that they are the uh priority that they need to be uh with the section 22 whatever whenever and, and again i don't even know why that isn't why we didn't go ahead and just confirm that now and why we're waiting for anything because from for Caroline and I, we need to understand what that is definitely before we decide what we want to do with park. The one should not be leading the other. We should have that information. So we're going to hold off and make our decision after we know that. But why on earth 
or how do we get our bylaw officers? And now I would say, we're gonna take park people and make them park ambassadors. So from parks and rec likely and a few other um, areas of the city potentially, have them going in proactively to confront people to say, hey, could you wear your mask? Could you do that? These people I think are gonna be more at risk than, than anybody. So I think this is- will a, be angry with them. Yeah, I think this is a Tony question, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and his answer is going to be um, these these priorities were defined by the province. Uh, Councillor Harder is right about the bylaw officers. Uh, there are actually the special constables as well for OC Transport were not considered in the policing group. Uh, they are in prior group one of the second phase or the second priority. And so they will get as soon as we get to that phase based on our um, vaccine. And I've assured Councillor Harder and I've ensured our bylaw team that they will get their vaccine uh, when we're in that phase. We must follow the um, priorities that are defined by the scientific table at the provincial level. We, we have no choice, we can't change that. Uh, but uh, I can assure you that when we get there, we're gonna get them um, vaccinated. With regards to the ambassadors, you're correct. That's something new and uh, they will be pulled in mostly from Parks and Rec, but from other areas. We will give them the appropriate PPE and the appropriate training, but uh, you're right, they're not even uh, considered on, on in phase two like for, for quite a while. So that, can, that is a challenge. Do you see an opportunity for the city to, to take on a greater role uh, in the near future from the province in determining what's best for Ottawa? Um, it's a difficult question and, and I'll let Brent talk. I, I sit on the... Um, on the table with the medical officers of health and the uh, the CEOs of the hospitals, and it um, to be candid, counselor, it's it's very much dictated by uh, Dr. Heyer, the provincial scientific table, and it's uh, not top down, but it is these are provincial decisions. There are some nuances that are given to the local medical officers of health, but not on not on this. And I'll let Dr. Malotny talk more if he if he wishes. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would stress is is that we, we have the challenge of, of limited vaccine supply and and, and a lot of, of groups, um, you know, quite legitimately asking ask, ask for vaccine. And so the challenge is 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 trying to to deal with that while at the same time, the people at most risk of, of hospitalization and deaths um, are, are those who are 50 plus. And so that's why that group has, uh, has, has been prioritized and we're working through that. And I think once we work through that and we have more vaccine, then uh, we can uh, work through the, the various uh, groups of essential workers. Thank you. I, so back to my first question on how do we get prioritized? You know, it's quite a while ago, months ago that we picked the, um, the uh, uh, neighborhoods that we were wanting to go in like a, a SWAT team and, and really, really help out. You know, it is. So how long do they become the priority when you've got the low hanging fruit from that neighborhood, when, when the goal should be as we have vaccine to get it into as many arms as possible. And you have a, a, a situation where you've got other communities that uh, certainly like, for example, um, I recently heard from, uh, a, well, this week from a gentleman 57, his wife's 57, live in Barhaven. Because of the postal code, the province picked two of their friends that live the same age in Riverside South, which has low numbers. Ca uh, Councillor Mean and I were just saying that low numbers, and, and they are, uh, they've gone to get their, uh, their immunization. This is where I go back to who knows best about this city? We've we've seen that with Vera and the and the direction that she's been going in, and then have that switch. I know it's probably not very popular for me to be saying that, but it's this, but it's damn honest. How do we do that? Do we pressure the uh, the provincial government? Do we what do we do? Because I think sitting back, I think that they've done a good job, but I think that now that we're into the position we are, where um, we know where this our situation and and potentially it's different than other places that we should not be able to make those decisions and that's especially i throw out that bylaw one which i did and also like in the suburban communities the number of retail workers in our stores are young people they are you know um i'm more worried about them because of their actions in their social lives 
and what what happens in the grocery store than the other way around. But it's an opportunity as well. So I've I've taken up a lot of time and and I'm sure a lot of people have other questions and I know I have some more, but um, I'll just ask them on the side. I thank you all. I'm not trying to be a, a crabby old person, um, but I can tell you that the people on this council very much want to help the residents of this city. We can't do it with our arms tied behind our back. We can't do it without information. And you have to trust us to be wise about the information you give us so that we can help our communities. Because guess what? In our communities, we know more than anybody about what makes them tick. So help us help you and help Ottawa. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jan. Appreciate okay. it. Um, I, um, Chair, I just have a couple of quickie. Um, sure, absolutely. Just, just a couple of things. Um, so, Councillor, that example of the, uh, the couple in their late 50s, so they would be eligible uh, for, for the pharmacy uh vaccine yeah, uh, I, and of course i know that yeah okay were, and of course they yeah, weren't anyone... they weren't when they said it to me it's within right. the last week i mean that just changed sure okay thank you thank you very much uh, uh both councillor and member kavanaugh we still only get five minutes but you're wearing two hats <laughs> okay thank you very much uh, uh mr chair for this um yeah, there was a lot of confusion about priority areas. Um, when I actually first heard about uh, K2V, I was convinced it was a typo uh, because we're K2B and we are a priority area. Um, and um, so did most of the residents and were, were quite surprised. Um, the, the other factor is, is that um, K2B, our, our area, actually has the highest number of seniors um, in the city. Was that not taken into consideration as well in prioritizing? So, I mean, I'll start. I mean, the, the K2B or the other uh, FSAs that, that the province uh, identified at, at their end, um, really the impact of that is, is in terms of eligibility in their booking system um, at, a, at a slightly lower age group. Um, but it's actually in our um, uh, priority neighborhoods, those are the ones that we've identified based on predominantly the, the amount of COVID that they've experienced, that we will provide clinics, uh, you know, with the pop-ups, the micro pop-ups that Tony was describing. Um, and so if it's, if a community is having, um, you know, more uh, COVID cases and are, are identified as a, as a high priority neighborhood, then those are the ones we're concentrating on. Um, and the only, the main difference is the booking is through the OPH uh, phone line versus through the provincial booking system. Yeah, thank you. And I appreciate that uh, K2B is a priority area and I appreciate the pop-up clinics that have happened at Ron Colbus Lakeside. Um, very, very helpful. Um, it's, it's, it's very much a, a, a help. Um, so um, do we have any statistics or numbers on the number of seniors who've received their vaccinations, like those over 70 or whatever, whatever numbers? Um, yes, Councillor, I can give you a few. Um, so for those who are uh, in their 80s and 90s, uh, it's over 85% uh, have received their first dose. Um, the coverage for the 70 to 79 year olds, it's now 74%, which is a, a big jump uh, in coverage since it was only 36% April 3rd. So, so in just over a week, uh, it's doubled. Um, you know, the 60 to 69 year olds, as you know, was added a little bit later, uh, and they um, are up to uh, 20%. Uh, they were only 11% on April 3rd. So um, I think it, it, it's actually, it's a really positive um, uh, result, um, like other parts of the province are, I think have been had more challenges, uh, but we are getting good uptake uh, in, in the age groups. And it's just, and it's a matter of, of time and supply as we've talked about. Um, and of course, it is going to take time to, to, to do that. Uh, and I'm going to, of course, uh, reinforce my message that, you know, the preventive measures now that we need at all age groups and by everybody in the next few weeks to really bend this uh, to avoid uh, the challenges. The other thing I would add is that our new vaccine dashboard provides this information for, for the public uh, and is updated regularly, uh, showing the coverage rates by age. Uh, that's very helpful. And um, I love the ideas of the micro pop-ups and 
um, I've had condo buildings volunteer for this. They're, they're actually perfect. They're kind of de facto retirement homes because most of the people who live in them are, are seniors. So, um, so uh, you know, Park Place has mentioned it. Um, I've got so many of them and they're um, all full of seniors. So I hope that uh, we, we, um, we uh, have more of them. Um, so, uh, that's very helpful. Um, in, but, I, but I did hear back from people in the over 90 vaccine com community that they didn't get their appointment for their second shot. And it was a, a lot of confusion. Uh, we just had it right now of, of whether they were gonna get phone calls or whether they were gonna have to just you know, wait for media to tell them. But um, a bit of frustration there as we're talking about people over 90. And um, so um, that, that was a little bit problematic though I totally appreciate and they do that they were out really early and that we got those vaccines out early. It's just this issue of they're, they're quite anxious about the second vaccine and uh, concerned about the messaging. So how, how are we, how are we gonna tackle that? Cause I, I am concerned that, um, you know, they're not social media people necessarily. And um, I think a phone call would have been better, frankly. Um, have any comment on that, on, on uh, how we're tackling it? Well, as, um, as I indicated earlier, the, the province is aware. Um, they're trying to get, because we got out early, those, those individuals are trying to get them on the provincial system where they can book their second appointment, which they, they tried now they can't, but they're aware. And as Dr. Uh, Malotny indicated earlier, we're going to use all our methods uh, through, through uh, the counselors, uh, um, through our social media, um, and try to get out in the media when, when this gets corrected and people can go online or can call the 1-800 number because they'll be able to do that as well too. But if they called it now, the operator at the other end of the province will say, I can't register you. So yeah, there's, there's that small group because we went way ahead of the the, the process because it was, you know, for Dr. Etches and the public health team, it was important for us to get to that group as quickly as possible. Uh, this glitch continues to, to hammer us and uh, we continue to, to tell the province that we need it resolved as quickly as possible. I appreciate that. Um, but we, I got my vaccine yesterday. I went to Nepean Sportsplex and in response to Councillor Dean, um, I had put, put myself on a waiting list for a pharmacy and as soon as I got an appointment with Nepean Sportsplex, I was able to very easily uh, take myself off the waiting list for the vaccine at the pharmacy. So there was no double booking. It can be done very quickly. And uh, I hope people will, will know that and uh, make sure that they take their names off. I do wonder about the issue of no-shows. Um, I hear sometimes that, you know, that it doesn't look very busy in a, in a clinic. And um, how are we dealing with it? And is it a big problem? Yeah, so uh, to, I can tell you it's not a big problem, which is a good thing. Um, that it doesn't look very busy in the, in the, in the clinics is uh, because, uh, I, and I think that's a good thing because that means we have the appropriate staff, the people when they get there, they flow through quickly and, and things are going well. Um, uh, I remind everybody that, um, you know, our, our model in the mass vaccination clinics are is designed to be able to you know, put through at least 2000 people a day. And, you know, if we had unlimited vaccine, that would even increase with the, with the current staffing that we have. So I think it's a combination of both because we're, well, we're well staffed. Um, you know, it's been, uh, it's been worked out. The teams now know each what their role is. Um, the experience that I hear from most people is quite smooth and goes quickly and no issue. Uh, so I think that's a good thing from a customer service perspective. Uh, also, it's a good thing for me knowing that as we do get more vaccine and we ramp up, we've got the infrastructure in place to do that easily and get people through. Um, and I can reassure you that there are some no-shows, but it's not significant and it's not a big problem. And we measure no-shows by the number of vaccines that are available at the end of the day, which are, again, that seems to be a, this other urban legend that there's, and that's untrue. There are some, obviously, every day here and there, but we have a process for that and we give it to the priority groups that are identified. And so people are called in at the last minute, healthcare workers, that type of thing, and they get that vaccine, so they're not lost. So um, thank you for bringing that question up because I, I think there's a lot of, uh, of that. And my understanding is in other jurisdictions, that's not what they're seeing. So I think perhaps that's why it continues to get repeated. And you know, we, we, we take that and think that's happening in our community. It is not happening currently. Okay, thank you. Um, a number of councillors have met, uh, mentioned about uh, the outdoor issue. 
um, in parks. And I've got uh, two regional parks in my area, Britannia and Andrew Hayden. And they were both very, very busy on the weekend. You see people um, sitting together in like semicircles with their lawn chairs, uh, no masks. Um, and it, you just feel aghast uh, about what to do. Um, and I really appreciate the fact that we're going to look at the Park Ambassador Program um, and coming up. I think that's really helpful. Um, is, uh, do we have any feedback on that um, in, in terms of uh, uh, how it worked last time and, um, and how it's going to be approached this time? Uh, yeah, perhaps I can ask that. It's, um, so the, uh, the Park Ambassador uh, Program um, was very successful last time. And I know Dan and his team's on here, but maybe he can answer more details, but that's why we want to replicate it. Uh, it does feel, I think, a good niche right away as people arrive that, you know, they're reminded of the rules and, and what we should be doing from a public health perspective. So I think that helps going in if people need to be reminded. Uh, and so uh, that's why we're going to be uh, re, um, re putting that in place again uh, this year. And Dan and the team, and if he wants to add anything, is, uh, is currently working on that. Thanks, thanks, Tony. Yes, based on last year's success, um, doing the interventions in the parks to provide information on the current rules and capacity limits was critical. The other important thing that we intend to replicate this year is to create a link between bylaw and the park ambassadors so they can identify issues. So they are eyes and ears in the park to, to, to assist with, with you know, resolving issues quickly. And the other part that we added uh, towards the end of the program, which I think, Councillor, you, you will appreciate, is keeping an eye on uh, park maintenance and garbage issues. Uh, we, we know we, we've had a rough start to the season with, with the warmer weather quickly. So one of the things we'll be asking the, uh, the park ambassadors is to help with Mr. Wiley's crews of identifying um, sites where there, there are over capacity issues with the garbage cans and whatnot. Thank you, you knew that was my next question. The other question is bathrooms. Um, COVID um, doesn't mean people stop going to the bathroom. <laughs> you know, we need bathrooms um, because people, honestly, there's a lot that don't have anywhere else to go. They go to parks because that's the only place they can get outside, they don't backyards. And um, I just, um, the concern is, is uh, we need sanitation in that respect as well. What are we doing about that? Uh, Councillor, we are uh, starting next week, crews will start to um, reactivate our, our park bathrooms. Most of them are not insulated. And so, uh, you know, plumbing needs to be winterized. We've now reached the point where it's warm enough overnight that we're not getting freeze up issues. So water will, will be turned back on. We hope to have uh, all of our permanent bathrooms in parks. So at beaches, places like Andrew Hayden Park, uh, some of our bigger parks, all uh, open by the long weekend in May. Uh, we are also starting um, in, and, and I'm not exactly sure on the timing, but our this year's contract for the delivery of portable washrooms, uh, porta potties, so to speak, uh, into parks. So you'll start to see those appearing shortly, uh, waiting for the half load restrictions and for the ground to firm up so that they can prob properly be delivered in parks. So that is coming very shortly as well. Okay. And, um, that last question puts you over the five minutes, Councillor. Um, I, I okay. Guess, but, okay. But, but, but thank you. Uh, and it, just to, to a couple of your points, um, you know, we're about halfway through the, the questioning here and a, and a constant theme seems to be around vaccination. And, you know, uh, we're not going to vaccinate our way out of this right now. We're not going to vaccinate our way out of this in the short term. So, you know, to, to points made by yourself and, and Council Harder, I mean, one of the things that councillors can do is to continue to push the basic public health message about distancing, yeah. wearing masks, washing hands, not gathering in groups outside of your household. I know we've been doing it for 13 months now, but those are the things that are going to get us through until we can get enough vaccines in people's arms. And the other comment I'd make, Councillor, is the other thing I think uh, councillors can help with, with the seniors especially, is promoting your communities, the idea that, you know, younger members of the community, younger family members adopt a senior in terms of keeping that ear open. 
you know, the, the, the 80 or 90 year old may not be on, on social media, but perhaps their grandchild is, or their, their son, daughter, niece, nephew, neighbor, um, and keep an eye and an ear open for when those, those opportunities come up to get the second shots and share that information. And I think that's a message we can share as counselors as well to look out for the more senior members of our community and, and, and help to keep them informed because we will push out through Tony and the city and OPH uh, through all, our, all our, our social media and traditional media and uh, uh, channels that the time is now for it to happen. And if we have to share that as a community with, with, with the older members. And I think that's something that you and I and the other councillors can push uh, in our communities and with our community associations uh, who often have different ways to contact the community and the city does. That's just, so that's just, just, just a comment. Um, our, next, uh, our next speaker uh, is, is uh, Councillor King. And there he is on the screen. Thank you, Chair. And uh, my first question really revolves uh, around information from uh, ICES, which was aggregated by the press, which suggests that despite our best efforts, Ottawa postal codes where COVID-19 rates are higher are still lagging in vaccination rates. Uh, a clear example within my ward is Rockcliffe and New Edinburgh, where the rate is 1.1 per 100 people, and the rate of vaccination is 15.4%. Whereas in Overbrook, uh, the rate is uh, two uh, per 100 people and the vaccination rate there is, is lower at 9.7%. Uh, Taking into account that there are obviously demographic age differences between the two neighborhoods, I was still wondering what are the plans to get the rate of vaccination up within uh, priority neighborhoods such as, such as Overbrook and, and Manor Park that have higher rates of COVID-19? So maybe I can start and, and uh, Brent can, uh, can add on as he sees fit. Um, I, I think that's a very appropriate question. And, and Chair, if I may kind of give a broad, um, we, we really have two, um, two clear objectives. The first is to vaccinate as many people as quickly as possible to move towards what people refer to in layman's term as herd immunity. And that strategy is done through our mass vaccination clinics where we can put a lot of people through in a short amount of time, get a lot of people vaccinated. But as the public health um, uh, special, uh, physicians will tell us, uh, that is good and that's important. But on the other side is what you're talking about, Councillor King, is we have um, the most vulnerable, so age, and those that are most um, disproportionately impacted. And so that's why the whole neighborhood strategy has been devolved. And it's really almost at, at, at a time, and particularly when we have limited supply, and that's, you know, I keep bringing that up. If we had, unli if we had unlimited supply, we would having, be having a completely different discussion because the mass vaccination clinics would be working, doing their magic, and every human resource asset we have would be putting SWAT teams in all these communities to massively get to them. And so that's the kind of the tension that we're always dealing with. Um, I, I, think, um, I think twofold, uh, we will continue uh, our um, targeted neighborhood strategies that have been identified by public health with teams and with partners in particular, we're adding partners, which are very important. Um, we're now innovating, as I said earlier, with these micro pop-ups and some, some areas too, to even get even more, uh, more detailed, uh, focused uh, strategies. So I think both those working at the same time will start moving that needle. I'll let Dr. Malotny talk, but one last thing I would tell you is, uh, and he may, he may say I'm, I'm wrong perhaps, but I, I would tell you that one of the other challenges in the numbers you're currently seeing is also a reflection of because we don't have enough vaccine, the ends are small and you can see these big swings and disproportionate that aren't reflecting the effort and the work that is being putting in by the teams. And I hope as we move forward, that'll re recalibrate and rebalance. That said though, not an excuse, we're using that. And I think you've pointed out some good examples of where we need to continue to do some focused work. So thank you. Brent, I don't know if you wanna add more. Yeah, clinical. no, I, I mean, I think that um, a, a few sort of, 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 of sort of epidemiology thoughts. I mean, first off, I mean, the ICES data is, is is the FSAs, which are bigger and more heterogeneous, and and I think that uh, the neighborhood rates are, are are going to be more useful. And the plan is to use that to identify 
which ones are we making more progress in and which ones are we not? And then, you know, do more in those. Um, so I think that's certainly a uh, part of, of this. Um, I think um, though that, you know, while I, I appreciate the vaccine question, I'm, I'm, I'm going to sort of reiterate um, that, that we are really not in a good place here. And, and things could go very, very badly here in Ottawa in the next few weeks in terms of our ability of our hospitals to keep up. Um, we're doubling, as I said in my presentation, every 12 days. So then the vaccine, you know, decisions that are being made, you know, day to day while important in that longer term. Um, it's the public health measures that are going to push this down. I mean, we're seeing Britain open up right now. They've got the majority of their population with one dose. And so it's going to be interesting to see, you know, with one, with, with one dose in the majority, um, you know, what's that like? And it'll inform what we do going forward. But I, I, you know, as your medical officer, uh, your deputy medical officer, I really need to convey to all of council, the boards of health, to members of the public that we are in a very, very serious situation and we need absolutely everyone, everyone's voice, everyone's connections to the community um, to essentially stay at home, stay with your family, push this down and protect our hospitals for their ability to care for people, not just COVID patients, but also the other people who are gonna need hospital care coming up. Thanks. I appreciate that that answer, and obviously, I think uh, all the members of council around the table have been really emphasizing the need to ensure that uh, public health measures are maintained around uh, hygiene, around uh, ensuring that uh, social distances, social distancing is maintained. Um, so uh, we are obviously uh, pushing that message, and uh, we are working in conjunction with community members uh, such as OLIP as well as the city's anti-racism secretariat and community health centers in order as well to uh, undertake that type of outreach, um, especially around uh, specific racialized communities. And I know that uh, you know these communities in conjunction with OPH have been running online uh, town halls in uh, language information sessions uh, uh, that are specific to specific neighborhoods and, I, and specific cultures. Uh, and I was just wondering, how are these sessions going? And are we seeing changes in people's overall hesitancy? And I know that uh, Dr. Vera Etches likes to use uh, the, the term instead, uh, vaccine confidence. Uh, you know, I, I, I was just curious, um, are we seeing changing attitudes uh, towards the vaccine based on uh, some of those sessions that are being undertaken? Um, I, I think there's an appreciation um, for, for getting information in their own language um, through venues that, that they feel more comfortable with. And, and I think, uh, Councillor, we were at the same OLAP meeting where we were talking about some of these and we were sharing the various uh, outreach that we were doing. And, and it really, this is almost like the third stage of that kind of outreach, because very early on, we were doing the outreach with communities around how to protect yourself and your families, how to access a mask. Because remember, we were having trouble, you know, would, would you know, individuals with low income, um, you know, have the ability to access a mask later on. And then we were working, you know, to, to talk about testing and other supports. And so some of the testing initiatives that we've had, we've wanted to have wraparound supports. And, and I think some of the, the feedback that we've had is, is working through people such as yourself, through faith leaders, other community leaders, and, and we, we, we had many of them at the OLIP meeting uh, in terms of them doing the outreach. And certainly our community engagement staff are, are doing that. The ones from the uh, Ottawa Health team are doing that. And I think are really important parts of, of, of that relationship. And, and I think if I even look back to the um, African Caribbean Black Mental Health survey that was all the work that was all started before that but the findings from that in terms of of, of trusted sources of information and how to uh to uh, provide information i think was helpful in terms of, of what we've had um uh, anecdotally i can say in some of the sessions that we've had i mean people have said oh now i understand some of this better because i've had someone be able to communicate to me in my own language english and french wasn't the first language and so it was very helpful for them to to, be, to better understand the 
the issues and the options available to them. I appreciate that. And I appreciate that there's been outreach to uh, vulnerable communities, uh, especially in uh, neighborhoods within uh, my own ward. Uh, there has been uh, discussions about uh, how people without a health care card as well can book an appointment. And in Ottawa, thankfully, I note that you don't have to use the provincial line. The OPH line will allow someone to book without a health card. However, uh, how does someone book a vaccination appointment if they have neither a phone or internet connection? Uh, will there be any opportunities for walk-in vaccination, especially in hotspot communities? And I ask this because we learned during the pandemic that up to 30% of residents who utilize uh, food bank services in, in Ward 13 don't have a phone. Uh, so this is a problem for people who are housed but are uh, still very, very vulnerable. Well, the, the quick answer is yes, that is a strategy that we're looking at. Um, it's a little more complex again, and, and I keep repeating this when we have limited vaccine and we have to um, you know, uh, ensure that we, we have movement of volume that we're being looked at by the province as well too. But as part of our strategy in the micro um, pop-ups, uh, one of the strategies, maybe that would be uh, uh, you know, an opportunity that would be valuable for some of these communities. And you've just described uh, an example of why that would be valuable. Um, we have to balance that off. I, I wouldn't want that to be you know, public knowledge. And you know, the demand is so great and our supply is so low that then we'd have you know, security issues that people would be going and those who would most need it would get bumped out. So uh, I can assure you, Councillor, that the team is already... Um, identified that as a possible strategy and we're looking at it at an opportune time, we will be implementing that so these people aren't left behind. I appreciate that and I appreciate the, uh, the potential uh, that was raised by uh, my colleague, uh, Councillor Fleury, around uh, OCH uh, properties and seeing if we can do vaccination in common spaces there, as well as uh, the comments of Councillor Kavanaugh. Uh, I've also received uh, requests uh, for vaccination uh, within a private uh, multi-dwelling unit uh, uh, where uh, there are common spaces and many seniors. Uh, my last question, noting uh, the concern of our deputy uh, medical health officer around uh, capacity um, of, of the health system. Um, obviously, ICU capacity is clearly something we've been hearing about that's at a, at a breaking point. And I know that this is probably more of the um, uh, concern of the of the Lynn and the, and the hospitals. Maybe it's more of their, their jurisdiction. Uh, but uh, if we're potentially reaching a breaking point uh, with CHEO opening its doors for uh, patients who aren't children for the first time. Uh, is there a plan around additional staff and uh, capacity uh, for, for ICU? Um, if, if the demand grows, as example, would we be able to tap into uh, resources from the military as example? I'm just wondering, is there a specific plan if, if we exceed uh, capacity? So I'll let uh, Dr. Malotny talk a little bit, but uh, the, the simple answer is yes. So you've, you've talked about one, um, and I think you've talked about the most important one, and, and I think others have mentioned this in the media recently, um, you know, um, setting up a field hospital, uh, getting uh, ventilators, getting ICU equipment that we need um, is not easy, but it's relatively easy. We can do that. The key component of that is the staff. The um, the, the physicians, the nurses, the, the uh, respiratory techs that need to work in those environments are highly skilled. So they're, they're the next uh, tier of, of their peers and they have uh, other skills. It's very much a specialty. Um, one area where they can be pulled from is uh, now, unfortunately, because it's not a good thing that as Dr. Malotny, uh, the, 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 um, the, the planned surgeries are being de de deferred. Some of those uh, scrub nurses and uh, have some of those skills they can be reassigned so uh, yes yeah, so on the on the logistics side of opening up field hospitals we've got capacity uh, getting equipment and all that it's fine it's on the human resource size that uh, is a bit of a challenge um, but uh, the team is looking at that and you're right it's the, the public health team but more importantly our hospital colleagues that are looking at some options there but Brent I don't know if you have anything that you want to add just by yeah your, your yeah reference. I mean and it is our hospital colleagues that that are you know are, are best place to answer some of the detailed uh, planning and options that they're thinking through I mean I think you know having you know talked to 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 the hospital sector this week is they really wanted me to convey that that they're they're worried I mean and and they're worried what's coming like I mean they're they're needing to 
uh, put a number of things in place to manage the current workload. Uh, you know, when I was talking to one executive, you say, and I, and I, we've got 10 people in emerge with symptoms and most of them are going to have COVID. So, so the people are still coming. Um, and when they come into hospital, they don't, they don't, they have long lengths of stay. They're often there for weeks. So it just adds 10 and 20 and 30. So it adds up. Um, so they're putting things in place, but I, I'd have to say like, this is an ideal way to provide healthcare uh, in terms of, of the, cause it's going past the capacity. Cause I think, you know, the, in the, the Ottawa hospital, I, I think they have, you know, somewhere around normally 56 ICU beds. Well, that will get exceeded in the next week or two. Um, and you know, the smaller hospitals, they will be exceeded if this trend continues. And part of it's unfortunately already baked in, as I said, in my presentation, because people became infected in the last couple of weeks and are working through their incubating, they're starting to develop symptoms. And unfortunately, some of them, their breathing is going to deteriorate and they're going to need hospital care. And, and nothing can prevent that because the infection already happened. So what we can do now is prevent any new infections. So hospitalization is going to continue for another week or so. We can prevent them in the second and third week. And we really need to because we can't double and double again. Well, with the danger that's presented by the new variants that are circulating, uh, we will uh, ensure that we get that message out to our to our constituents to ensure that they are protecting their health, that they are following the uh, the guidelines. And uh, my last, uh, um, just uh, this is more of a clarification based off of Councillor Gower's observation and question. Uh, so what you're clearly stating around vaccination is that in a sense, there are two systems in place around the hotspots for vaccination. Uh, that uh, the, the province um, having selected specific uh, uh, postal codes, that's within their registration system. But obviously we are exercising as a city our own discretion over our own priority neighborhoods. Because I know that that was a concern uh, for some of my residents uh, that what does this mean? And so uh, what uh, uh, I clearly understood was that uh, there is one system that is uh, being driven by the provincial registration, but we at OPH have our own system and we are going to continue to move ahead uh, through our own discretion at, uh, at with uh, registration and, and, and vaccination uh, within our own priority neighborhoods. That is absolutely correct, Councillor. Okay, right. thank yeah. you for that clarification and thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, Councillor uh, uh, Kitts, please. Thank you. Uh, lots of valuable information already shared. Uh, a lot of my questions have already been answered. Uh, so thank you. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of discussion today about, about parks. Um, and I, I think the message from you, Dr. Malachny, is, is clear that we need to promote good park behavior. Um, and, and I can appreciate that this might be hard to track, but do we have data at this point in time that indicates that there has been transmission in parks specifically? Um, we have data from last year. Um, okay. We have, you know, one of those big infographics that we did on, on a barbecue, uh, where there was transmission at this multi-family barbecue. Um, and then it proceeded to spread from those people who got infected into their households and then into schools and daycares and, and off. And so one case became many, many and hundreds of people got exposed. So, so we certainly have those kinds of examples. I, I think that uh, we can also look at knowing how COVID is spread. Um, you know, we, we know that if there's close prolonged contact, if people are, are talking or, or, or otherwise don't, are not masked and, and, and are talking or singing or, 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 or laughing, all those things are going to increase uh, the expression of, of, of droplets. Uh, and all of those things are a concern in, in a park setting in different ways. You know, you can have, as I said, the example, you know, the parents watching their kids play and having a conversation on a bench. So they're from different households. Maybe they're having a coffee, don't have masks on and they're not distance and they're doing it prolonged. So by, by definition, knowing how COVID is spread 
that that's going to be a higher risk scenario. So, um, you know, the concern is then uh, we want people to be able to use parks, mm -hmm. but we want it to be as safe as possible. And so that's why the messaging that we want to have done as well as looking at our section 22 to uh, require masks in certain situations. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, I wanted to echo Councillor DeRuz and Al Shantiri's comments about how appreciative our rural residents uh, have been for the opportunity to get vaccinated close to home. So thank you. Um, and, and just to be crystal clear, Tony, I know you've almost already answered this, but I'm getting a ton of questions about it. So can you confirm that rural residents who received their first dose at a pop-up clinic, even though they don't have their second dose booked, it will happen within the four month period? That is correct. It will happen. And we are hoping that the current glitch that is in the provincial system, they will re um, repair it and then they will be able to book in the provincial system. But yes, okay. absolutely. Okay. And so could it be reasonable to assume then that they'll hear about the booking of their second appointment, probably around the, the three month mark from when they got their first dose? I would actually hope it would be before that. I would okay. have hoped the provincial system would have been fixed already and then they would have announced it. We could have let everybody know and then they could have gone online and booked their, ne their next appointment. Um, but uh, that, that's not done yet. So it, sh it should be imminently. And, I, and I'm sorry, I, I imminently means I don't know because it's <laughs> under the province's control. No, I appreciate that. Thank you, Tony. Um, finally, I, I just have one other question. And I, I know that the message today needs to be that we need to control the spread of the virus and, you know, the concerning situation that we find ourselves in Ottawa with respect to the number of cases and, and hospitalizations. And, you know, I will continue to share that that critical message. But from where I sit, and I think it is important to share, I, I'm getting increasingly concerned about people tuning out the messaging, uh, and in some cases, you know, unfortunately, rebelling against the messaging. And, you know, I know we're seeing an increasing number of cases in, in my own age group. Um, and, you know, in, in community groups on Facebook, I'm seeing more instances of residents arguing with each other about the restrictions, showing concern for their children. And uh, I'm just increasingly concerned about the deteriorating mental health of, of so many in our community. Uh, you know, I share that we have resources that are available regularly, but what I wanted to ask is, I know that the city is working on a plan for COVID-19 economic recovery, which is separate from our normal economic development initiatives. Is Ottawa Public Health currently working on a plan that is separate from its typical initiatives that will, you know, really rebuild the mental health of our community? So thank you, Councillor. There, 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 there was a lot there. So let me see if I can unpack that that a little bit. Um, you know, um, I, I think in terms of people um, perhaps being complacent, I think it's to totally reasonable to be tired. I mean, we're all frankly tired of this COVID thing. Um, so I think the more voices there can be, and I think that's counselor voices. I think it's business leaders. I think it's, it's the hospital folks who is, can add to the message. And I would say it right now is, you know what? This is different. I know we've been in this a long time, but we're not kidding here. We actually have a serious problem now, and this is what we all need to do. So I think there's that piece. And, and I think we all have a role to play there. I think in terms of, of, of mental health, um, you know, much of our capacity, of course, is, is been reallocated to, well, it's just to respond to, to it. And now we've got a second line of business, which is the biggest mass campaign uh, uh, initiative in, in, in our history. Um, but with our, our, our limited resources in mental health, we've prioritized. And so we've really focused on mental health awareness, um, on, on concerns about stigma, um, supporting certain scenarios like parents, uh, like uh, 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 people, uh, workplaces, um, outreach to, to places of worship. So those are all um, happening. We've continued our work in suicide prevention um, because, you know, there's more people calling crisis lines. There are, you know, more overdoses occurring. So our most vulnerable, uh, this has been really challenging for them to, to, to get through this. Um, we've been working with over 30 partners, uh, with the Royal Ottawa being a major backbone to this, to have a one number 
to call or one or one website to go if you have mental health or addictions issues. So it's, so it's accessmha.ca. So before it was difficult to get through the system uh, because it was complex. Now Ottawa partners have come together one stop and, and the similar system for children and youth is also being put in place with CHEO's leadership. So I think there's a number of things that are happening now um, just while we're in this. And I think as we get through the other side of this, um, you know, uh, we can look at more in terms of what, where are we going forward? Um, certainly other parts of our organization, uh, have been working with the business community all the way through this, uh, uh, in terms of providing guidance. Um, we're regularly at the mayor's economic task force, regularly at the board of trade and other, uh, business partnerships. So, I mean, I think there's a number of things going on. Um, but again, uh, I'm going to take us back to the, you know, the real, you know, urgency we have in our city right now, uh, because we've got to make a change. Um, and that's why as many voices as possible, uh, in different age groups is going to be really critical to turn this. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, uh, thanks to, to everyone on the call for all you do. Thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, next is, uh, Member Lakin. Thanks, uh, Chair. Thanks, uh, Mr. Devonti and Dr. Maloney, Maloney for your comments. Um, I think we're all hearing very clearly, these are dangerous times. This is an urgent situation we faced and I appreciate you reiterating for that. There, there will be a time when we can start to think about um, how to return to normal could we? Could I ask a bit about OPH's uh, guidelines or thinking around what will be needed once the province says yes, that will allow us to reopen our schools? What guidelines will OPH be using to assess the safety and readiness for schools to reopen? Yeah, no, thanks, Councillor. And and I would just, you know, if I if I think back, I mean our sort of concerns about schools uh, reopening next week was really around the mobility and all the interactions that go with probably a couple hundred thousand people on the move twice a day and the experience with our previous lockdowns and what's happened in, in European countries with VOC fueled resurgences about what do we need to bend the curve? Like we could see where this was beginning to go uh, and we were looking at what else needs to be in place in the suite of interventions uh, to, to, to bend this. Um, so it was less about the transmission. Of course, the more cases there are in the community, the more that's going to get imported in, into schools. Um, and we've seen that repeatedly and other places have seen that as well. Um, the good news is that in general, um, the layers of prevention in schools um, have been very effective at preventing transmission if you know a, a staff person or, or a child comes in with an infection. And we've not seen much in the way of transmission within schools. So I think when um, it, at some future date when this has bent and we're on the downward trajectory, then I think that will be a time to, to be looking at, you know, when do schools open and hopefully they open first and then some time is given before other uh, parts of society are open. So again, that principle of, uh, of last to close, first to open. Um, I think that, uh, you know, at the testing task force where I work with the, the testing partners on behalf of OPH, um, you know, we've tried some additional uh, types of testing to, to see, uh, you know, in terms of adding and, and, we're, and we're also putting additional ideas of what might we have in place when schools reopen as an additional piece. But I think we'll need to, because we'll have taken a break, is remind ourselves and remind parents and, and children and the school system about all of those preventive measures that we need in place that work together to prevent transmission. Thank you uh, for that. And I am um, delighted to hear that it's the intention to try and do it uh, early only because we know there are serious harms when they're closed and schools actually act to curb spread. So thanks for that. 
in the service to prepare for schools reopening and with the rollout structure as it is for educators, is there room for any local adaptation um, when educators get their turn to adapt the prioritization of educators the way healthcare workers have been prioritized? At the hospital that I work in, in my office at clinic, um, I'm prioritized based on my degree of front facing. Is there uh, adaptation, adaptability within our ability to roll it out in a similar way for educators? Yeah. If so, I can start, Brent, I was, I was yeah. just going to say uh, that currently there are two, two avenues available. And that is the province has said that, that special ed educators uh, are to be vaccinated right now because they have contact often with students that either can't or have difficulty keeping themselves masked and, and socially distanced. And then of course we have the pharmacies available for any, uh, any teachers that are 55 and above. And then thirdly, uh, there is in the high priority neighborhoods, anybody who is 50 and above. So there are a number of avenues in place already that will allow teachers to uh, to get to get vaccinated. Um, and I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Brent and, and Tony. But there there already are three three avenues out there that that can, there are accessible um, by uh, by teacher groups. Yeah. No. That, that, thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, I think that uh, you know with teachers would fall within those that, that sort of group of essential workers in phase two. Um, and, and certainly we wanna to get to that as quickly as we can. Um, at the moment um, with our limited vaccine supply, the, 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 the critical need is to uh, be immunizing those at most risk of, of hospitalization, hospital, sorry, hospitalization and death, uh, those who are, who are 50 plus. And so that's where, you know, the effort's going to be in the upcoming uh, weeks. And then, of course, as we've discussed uh, many times through this call, the, uh, the residents of, of high uh, uh, priority neighborhoods. So, so those are, are groups that, that are, you know, the, uh, are right now the, the top of the list with respect to vaccine. Um, and we were wanting to get to the essential workers uh, as soon as we can as uh, supply allows. Tony, do you have anything else to add from, a, from the EOC? No, I, th I think that's well covered. The only thing is I have been on some of the provincial calls and maybe related to this, when we do the total number of, uh, of education workers, including everyone that in, is in those institutions to keep them uh, the children safe. Um, I think if when we get a sufficient vaccine, we won't perhaps have to uh, sub uh, triage them. I think you'll be able to get them all done, except for the special education group they're doing now. And then after that, when we get into that next group, I think they're all going to be done all together. So it'll probably be in a better in a better space, including the custodial staff, etc. So that's what they're that's what the planning team has been looking at at the provincial level right now to give you some sense of uh, where that may go. Thank you for that. Really, that really was the question is when it is their turn, will that prioritization be required as it was done in the healthcare system or whether there will be sufficient as you predict to not have to worry about that. So thanks for clarifying that. Thank you all. And thanks for taking the time to brief us. Thank you, Member Lake, and appreciate it. Um, uh, next is uh, uh, Councillor Menard. Councillor Menard, are you out there? Okay, we'll move to the next, uh, and we can pick up uh, Councillor Menard if he if he's having trouble logging in. Um, uh, Councillor, he's Sutton. just on. Sorry, he's just oh. on now, Chair. Oh, okay, perfect. I Sorry, Sean. That's okay. Uh, no, I guess I just they they took their time letting me in, so I'm here. I'm here, Chair. It's been a it's been a good discussion. Um, thanks for all the uh, the the answers and feedback um, that have been received. I, I'll try to uh, keep it relatively uh, relatively quick. Um, I guess my first um, question is is really around. Uh, the ability to amend our strategy or not. And we, we keep referring back to the provincial vaccination rollout strategy. 
and uh, obviously different regions have different priorities. So th- does OPH you know, in Ottawa have the ability to amend the provincial vaccination rollout? Um, so Councillor, to only to, to small degrees. I mean, I mean the, the province is, establishes the framework. Um, the, the province allocates the vaccine. And so within those narrow parameters, um, you know, we are, you know, trying to have the most impact we have with the vaccine available. So I would say the work that we are doing um, with uh, the high priority neighborhoods is, is an example where we see a need uh, to be cut based on, on the rates of, of, of COVID that, that neighborhoods have experienced to be able to, uh, to prioritize those. And, and I think is, is, is supported by the province uh, and is a way in which, uh, you know, what we're doing locally works in tandem with, with the, the provincial booking system for, for the mass uh, uh, clinics. Um, so I would say that, that there's very small um, wiggle room uh, and we do have a, a prioritization uh, committee of involving local uh, stakeholders, uh, co-chaired by one of our associate medical officers of health, Dr. Arneson. Um, and they, they will sort of discuss sort of fine tuning type pieces, but really the, the, the the provincial framework lays the major uh, structure of, uh, of of who goes when and what order. Okay, okay. Um, just I asked because I think in other regions in Ontario, the Niagara region, for example, they've really been prioritizing uh, childcare, uh, elementary, uh, secondary school sectors um, for vaccination uh, based on on risk factors that they've identified. Uh, in terms of exposure to infection, the transmission within a congregate environment, the risk to disruption of, of in-person learning. Um, and so uh, I recognize the risk factors you've spoken about today around the hospitalization um, piece, and uh, that's incredibly important. But we're, all, we're also saying schools should be last to close and first to open. And of course, um, you know, lots of things are going to be open on Monday, but not schools. Um, so I guess, um, you know, I, I think it's important that we, we do recognize there's many 50 year olds in our city and 55 year olds who have been able to work from home and are not at risk, uh, but are able to receive vaccination. Um, and so I think that's where, um, there's questions coming from my community, especially on, on school and schools and educators. So, um, I, I'm happy to raise that more at our Board of Health meeting on, on Monday, but that is a concern that is continually coming up uh, for the frontline workers and essential workers in our, in our city. Um, I, I guess uh, I wanted to know uh, if we're going to be sending a mailer out to all households in Ottawa. There's a lot of things that are changing um, and uh, people are somewhat... Uh, Sean, some- could, Sean, can I interrupt just for a second? I'm just wondering, since Tony's on the line here but won't be at um, the public health meeting, if, if maybe he could just comment on, on that last point you made, especially in light of, of his understanding of what our supply of vaccine is, is like over the next little while. Okay. If you um, don't mind, Mr. DeMonte? No, not at all, Chair. Just for some clarity, is it more on the comment of that uh, Niagara seeming to do something else uh, than, as Dr. Malotny said, I mean, he, he was a little more, more um, I think, uh, articulate in his answer. My answer would have simply been, unfortunately, I think the province is dictating the way we do this. And there's very little that uh, our public health unit locally can do, um, uh, although that we, we have done some things. But um, Chair, just w- what part I do you also, want me- I also meant in terms of flexibility, uh, Tony, uh, in, in light of what supply we yeah. know we have. Yeah, so when I look at what supply we have, uh, already to the 30th what supply we did have is com- all our, our um, mass vaccination sites are completely booked up um, the team has put aside for our key projects so remember i talked about two philosophies the one that, that we're trying to get mass vaccination and then our targeted so we've put aside uh, enough vaccine for our targeted projects that we're doing in our high risk neighborhoods um, but uh, other than that um, I, I think that's what that's the kind of model you'll see 
for the next little while until we start seeing other vaccine arriving that we can do anything else and have flexibility to do anything else. And even just to understand the uh, special ed uh, workers, we couldn't even accommodate that within our vaccine supply. It's our hospital supply. So some of the next priority healthcare workers are kind of being pushed a little bit to a week after till we get all those 3000 done. So you can see how tight our, our maneuvering room is. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that, Chair. And uh, sorry, my son just got home. Sorry, buddy. I got to just ask two more questions and I'll come see you. Okay. One second. Okay. Sorry. Um, and so I'm just wondering um, on the parks piece. So we mentioned that there's going to be, um, there's been some talk about a um, masking in, in parks. Um, and I just would like to get more clarity because there's already confusion on social media and other places. Are we talking specifically about like the playground play structures? Uh, are we talking if we're just within two meters of someone else, uh, not in the same household? Um, and, or, or are we speaking about parks writ large that there's a requirement to mask anytime you're in a park? I just, can somebody get clarity on that? Sure, um, so thanks for the question. Um, so we're focusing on the amenities uh, within parks that, that, that attract numbers of people and, and, and we've been experiencing crowding with lack of distancing and masking. So, so that, so I mean, the examples I gave earlier were, were basketball courts and, and, and skate parks um, where you not only have a number of people sometimes in the playing area, so to speak, but also all the way around. And so we were faced with similar sorts of things with, uh, with the winter, uh, with the rinks. And so our section 22 class order for winter recreation amenities um, tried to address some of those concerns and, and, and established uh, uh, expectations for masking asking in, in various situations. So we're, we're looking at the same type of thing where there's in certain situations, certain amenities and in the vicinity of it where you'd be expected to be masked. Um, some of the um, uh, of those amenities where we would also uh, have capacity limits uh, because uh, uh, we want people to be able to use parks. We want people to have that, that mental health uh, benefit, to be able to be physically active for people who don't um, have a backyard, you know, um, to be able to, to have fresh air and, and, and have a picnic with their household. But, you know, it, it only should be with your household. Um, and people should have masks with them when they're in parks because you, you may anticipate that walking through the park, there won't be other people, but, you know, depending on when and where there might be. So you want the ability to, to put your, uh, to your mask on if you're finding that there's, uh, you know, increasing numbers of people on the path that you're needing to, to, to get around. Okay, that offers a bit more clarity and I think makes a lot of sense if there's, if there's places where people are, you know, the amenity spaces within a park or um, people where people can't keep two meter distance, for example, um, that's helpful to just clarify for folks. When, when will we know the exact details of this? When is the public going to know? Uh, uh, we're, we're working away. Um, and so our goal is to, to have something by the weekend. And, uh, you know, when we have that finalized, uh, you know, uh, the city communications and OPH uh, will be busy getting that out to people. Um, as Dan Chenier said earlier, that they'll be working on signage um, for the, for, uh, the, the, the sites. Um, and, of course, for any of our uh, class Section 22 orders, we, we have it posted on our website for, for people to see. Okay, and Sean. Okay. When we sh when we share it with counselors, we, we, you know, we won't just send you a copy of the order. There'll be a little there, there'll be a little bit of background to it when it's sent out. So, okay, okay, that's very helpful. Uh, we're already getting questions on it, so that that's great. Um, with regard to a, a mail or, or something to all households, there's a lot of questions from people how to get uh, you know vaccination, the, the different models of that, uh, the new issues we're seeing now with the orders coming forward. Are, are we going to be sending a mailer out to all households in Ottawa to, to try to get this information out? Um, part of the challenge is, is the information changes quickly. Like if you think of what's happened in just the last two weeks between um, there was a provincial lockdown announcement, then a stay at home order, then the schools not reopening. Um, 
the things that we're doing locally, I mean, I described uh, the, uh, the the letter of, uh, in, of instruction to businesses, the section 22. I, I think it's difficult to, to try and capture that and stay up to date if a mailer, but I think we can um, use all the other sort of channels um, through, through news channels, through our website, uh, through social media and other mechanisms to, to make people aware. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I do think at some point there may make sense to put a mailer out to everybody in Ottawa, just when the, we have larger openings of our uh, vaccination clinics, when there's more supply, it may make sense to, to do that and may, may need to be a decision of the board of health. Um, so I appreciate that response right now. Things are changing rapidly. Uh, my last uh, question. That's Sean. That's your five minutes, unfortunately. Um, okay. sure, and we have a couple of people still to go. Okay, thanks very much, Chair. But happy Chair. birthday. Thank you. Thanks. See you later. Um, so next we have Councillor Suds. Excellent. Thank you very much, Chair. And thank you. Uh, a lot of great questions have been asked and a lot of great information has been shared. So my thanks uh, to everyone for that and for all your hard work. Uh, just a couple brief questions, hopefully. So one um, that I haven't heard mentioned yet is with respect to childcare. Um, so I'm hearing from parents getting questions as to um, are they allowed to have grandparents, for example, uh, in their home watching their children um, so that they can do their jobs? And I guess a second piece to that is what if that then means there are over five people in the household? Tony, is that something that you can? Um, I don't want to touch the grandparent piece. <laughs> I, I, hear what the, I hear what the counselor said saying um, the five people limit is, um, you know, in household only or so uh, it's five people outdoors. So inside the households. Uh, so if it's your your household, so I'll let the, I'll I'll defer and uh, try to pass the baton doc to Dr. Malotny with regards to his uh, clinical opinion of the risk that that provides. Yeah, so I mean, it's um, I, I guess an issue of of, of balancing uh, risks uh, in terms of to the the person coming in to the caregiver um, in terms of you know, what their age is and their health condition, uh, because they, they are exposing them themselves. Um, but, uh, you know, there's also, you know, what are the consequences of, uh, of, of, of not doing that? Um, so, I mean, I think, I, I, I think it, it comes down to an individual sort of household decision. Um, yes, it, it's, uh, you know, no one from outside your household, but I do believe there's a provision for, for a caregiver. Um, so, so from a legal standpoint, um, I'm not the legal person. I don't enforce bylaws, but um, I, I suspect that is okay. But I would look to Tony uh, from the enforcement side of things. But I think from the public health risk perspective, I would, I mean, my primary concern would be the, 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 the grandparent who obviously is going to be older uh, and the risk uh, of their exposure to the family and, and the potential consequences, because certainly the risk of hospitalization goes up markedly with each decade of life. Um, and so that there would have to be a, a, a knowledge, an acknowledgement of that. And, and uh, I think it also depends on, you know, the rest of the people in the family, what are their exposures? Uh, you know, have they all been pretty well isolating and staying all by themselves and not going about? Uh, and then as a grandparent doing the same, that would be less risky than if you have maybe a, a number of essential workers uh, in the home that are going out and about or socializing, etc. So I think it, it is a, a challenging situation. Um, and I think each family would need to decide on their own. And, and certainly the, the grandparent would, would really need to make an informed choice here. Yeah, and I can tell by your answer. I mean, I've certainly got that question, uh, you know, a number of times from my residents, I'm sure other counselors has not it, and it's a tough one to answer um, for all the reasons you just said, but, but I'm hearing there's nothing in law um, and that is precluding it, but it is really, uh, you know, a factor of, you know, determining those risks and making personal decisions. Um, and I, I mean, people are struggling, obviously, this week being um, East, not Easter break, sorry, April break. 
And then with school not going back, it, it is certainly challenging, I know, for a lot of families. Um, okay, next question. So the section 22, I, I won't ask you all the details because I know you're working through it and I'm sure it, it, it is a struggle. It's a lot of work to nail those details. A few comments. Um, I've had questions about park benches. So residents reaching out to ask, you know, are they allowed to use the benches? Are the benches safe? Um, I, I don't necessarily need an answer right now, but I, you know, whether that's a consideration as you go through the work uh, for the section 22. Um, the last piece I wanted to raise um, in your consideration around the section 22 is whether consideration is being given for uh, recreational amenities that may be on privately owned land and or schoolyards. Um, so I can think of a number of parks, uh, parks, city parks in my ward that are attached to a school. So there's also the schoolyard and the park adjacent. Um, some of those basketball courts that I'm getting lots of complaints about are on the school property as an example. Um, so another consideration as you work through your section 22. And then similarly, uh, thinking about private recreational amenities, I've had lots of questions about uh, both tennis clubs as well as golf. A lot of golf questions in the last week. Um, and I can attest right now, I look out my window and I see the folks on the uh, fourth green here. And, uh, you know, unfortunately not, a, a large portion are not physically distancing and no one is masked. So it's a question of whether that is a high risk activity and whether it's something that we should be addressing through the section 22. And I'll leave it at that. Right. So, so thank you, Councillor. <laughs> I'll, I'll try and answer some of those. Um, and and certainly these are this is some of the challenges in terms of of pulling this this together uh, in terms of what's in scope and out of scope for this initial one. And I'd indicated earlier that you know we're going to go for the most obvious ones right away, um, and with the opportunity to add and 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 uh, adjust this as needed. Um, so in order, so first off, I think, um, we've learned with COVID that, that people are the bigger risk than, than, than surfaces. Um, you know, you still have to be concerned with, with surfaces and I, you know, uh, it's good, you know, if you're going to be touching things that you would have some hand sanitizer before you were going to touch your face or, or eat, you know, there is that, but quite frankly, it's, if the person sitting beside you on the park bench, isn't a member of your household, that's, that's, that's the risk. Um, or if you're having coffee with a neighbor across the picnic bench and you're talking to each other, so you don't, you're not masked, you're prolonged contact and you're talking to each other. Um, so so that's that's that that's a concern and, and, and a risk. So, um, uh, so certainly, uh, you know, I don't. At this point, we're not wanting to have things closed. We want people to be able to use parks, uh, you know, for the mental health and physical activity reasons that we've discussed. And so that's the spirit. Um, in terms of schoolyards, yes, we have thought of that, uh, or at least our, our lawyer has, uh, in terms of, yeah, and I agree with you, it, it, sometimes it's difficult to know the boundary between where's the school stop and where's the park, and some of them uh, in some cities uh, have done them in partnership. Anyways, um, what it will be, I think, is likely that it would include the school structures, uh, as long as they're not being used by the school you know, uh, for, for, for their learning. So, um, those, so we are thinking of some of those, some of the other ones, um, we're going to take back and think further. So thank you for that. But that's the idea is to focus on the areas where, where there is crowding, where we've seen issues, uh, where people are congregating and to, to reinforce masking in those while at the same time recommending, frankly, people mask all the time, but have your mask with you for sure to be able to put it on if you're, uh, say, walking through an area and there, there are more people. And of course, parks aren't the only place where people can potentially come into interaction with other people. So all the things we're talking about, staying with your household, masking and distancing applies 
basically throughout our, our, our life, whether we're, you know, walking around the, 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 the drainage pond uh, in, a, in a suburb or, you know, walking down, down streets or other paths uh, or otherwise interacting with other people. Uh, we, we really need to double down now, reduce our number of contacts and bend this curve uh, because now is the time. Yeah, fantastic. And maybe one last point I'll add to that. Um, you know, your comment, I think now more than ever, people are enjoying their neighborhoods. People are getting outside in numbers we haven't seen uh, in normal circumstances. And that does mean that the sidewalks are busier. That does mean as well that our pathways are much busier as well as the parks. Um, but I think those pathways um, and sidewalks, you know, they're, they're, there could be some consideration around how to manage that as well. Um, when I'm out and about, um, you know, it's probably 50-50 people wearing masks versus not on our pathways and our sidewalks. Um, but some, some direction or at least some really strong messaging there uh, is certainly warranted as well. Uh, and my thanks, thank you to everyone. It's a, you know, I know this is an incredible journey and incredible amount of work, but your, your leadership and dedication is, is certainly not unnoticed by the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Tierney. <laughs> the joys of having T for a last name. And I got all the way through it, Keith, and I, we got to Suds and she asked like three of my questions. So this is gonna be quick and dirty. Um, so on that note, uh, talking about amenities, and I'm thinking ahead, uh, last time we went through this, splash pads were considered a safe zone. How would that look? Are, are we thinking that far ahead yet about uh, are splash pads considered safe? Um, to, to be honest with you, um, uh, we're, we're putting that one aside. Like uh, the, the focus for the this week's work to, to get the section 22 out because we really want to get it out for the weekend was what do we need to have in right now? Uh, sure. Yeah, I see, I see the splash pads and the water parks coming up in the not too distant future. And, and so I want to buy us a little bit more time and think that one through. I do recall the challenge of, of, of coming up with recommendations and guidance. Certainly masking isn't going to work. Right. Because, you know, uh, there's no such thing really as a waterproof mask or at least one that's going to be useful to filter, which is the whole point. So we're going to have to think that one through in terms of, of what is reasonable. Um, but I mean, the advantage is obviously is the water and the sun. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so those things are, are to the advantage. But at, at this point, where it's not for this week's Section 22, we're going to give that some further talk, obviously talk to our partners in our CFS uh, in terms of what makes sense and we'll also look at what's the latest information on risk and, uh, and, and, and uh, um, come up with the best recommendations. I mean, th there's the masking side of things. There's the capacity limit side of things. So there might be some combination we can do, but then with just like uh, play structures, you have the parents co potentially congregating around, right? right? Um, so that, you know, we might have something then for them in terms of, uh, of expectations. So more thinking to do, but it, it, it's on our list. Wonderful, thank you, I appreciate that. And if you can, you've done a tremendous job and please keep us in the loop. And the only reason I brought that up uh, as well as all the amenities that we've discussed and look forward to seeing what those uh, exact amenities are is um, I'm glad there was a change today in, in this, this, uh, this reducing the hours per park and targeting, targeting certain parks because I have a lot of towers in my area. Uh, there's a lot of people that uh, don't have the luxury of air conditioning. And whether it's splash pads or even be able to be able to be socially distanced within a park uh, with their family to be able to get some cool down air towards the later hours of the night. Uh, really important stuff. So, uh, you know, from a the ambassador park program, especially in those areas, there's real congregate settings or uh, socioeconomic uh, challenges. Is this something that we're thinking about where we're planting these specific people that are going to help people in parks? Um, if Dan is still on, I guess he would oh, be the I'm best person Dan, to answer. Dan is still oh, there. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you, Dan. Yes. Uh, yes uh, much like last year, we are going to focus on the parks that are showing more activity, the busier parks. For, for the most part, the small neighborhood pocket parks are, are, are not the issue. So uh, next week or later this week, when, when the groups go out, they will be starting with where we've already had reports of uh, uh, a lot of activity uh, and we'll move out from there as, as we get through the summer. So, so yes. And if, uh, 
councillors have sites that they observe or hear from residents are an issue. Um, happy, we, we, you know, on a daily basis, we, we, we do a stand up for this group on, in terms of where to go uh, and happy to take your suggestions. Oh, thanks, Dan. You're, you're great and really appreciate it. And I've been working very closely with our Eastern Auto Resource Centre. We've actually gone out in multi-languages telling people, please stay far apart, but certainly if you need to get in a park. And I'm just preparing for that heat wave that seems to be coming. And we always, you know, splash pads always save us. Uh, the access to those, uh, those parks are really beneficial. So thank you so much, Dan. Um, real quick, uh, the other one too, uh, I'm running into a lot of problems and lots of calls from fitness facilities uh, being overloaded with people. And I know that there's a provision in there where certain people can actually use uh, the fitness clubs. Um, I know there's been tickets handed out at certain ones uh, citywide, including even my own. Um, is there a, a strategy around that to make sure it's only the specific people that are allowed to use those fitness clubs? clubs yeah, there is. Sorry. Yes, chair, there is. Um, the bylaw team has been looking at that and, um, um, there are um, some of these fitness clubs that are being very responsible. And as you indicate, you know, if you have a doctor's note and you're doing a physical therapy of some site, you're, you're allowed. Um, we're seeing, um, uh, you know, a, a plethora of doctor's notes that uh, one can get from Google. So there, there, there's questions being raised as a result of that. Uh, and then there's other fitness calls that are the clubs that we've charged uh, multiple days in a row. Um, that are um, just abandoning. It's not even a question of uh, they're, they're, they're staying open and, and defying the provincial order. And we're looking at other measures that we can completely shut them down um, because that's inappropriate. And, you know, we walk in, there's 40 people working out there and these are not people that need to be working out without masks, et cetera. So uh, uh, we're looking at that. It, it is a, it seems to be a problem sector for us right now. So we're looking at that, but yes, we want to again, use, the appropriate um, a touch because there are in certain circumstances um, tools in those fitness clubs for patients that need uh, uh, therapy that are on, under uh, medical supervision. So uh, we have to balance that out, but uh, they, um, in general, they have been a challenge. Some of these, uh, um, not all of them, but the, the ones that have we've on day after day, we're going in and charging them. And we're actually looking at perhaps at another tool that exists of the medical officer health of closing them down permanently. So that's, uh, that's in the works right now. Wonderful. Thanks, Tony. Well, I got you on the hook here. Uh, I want to thank your, uh, the bylaw staff. Uh, I've not only had that issue, I also had an Airbnb uh, with many people, many people charged, uh, and we're looking at trying to strip them uh, of their ability to have that household as an Airbnb, especially all the property damage and craziness during COVID. How, how, how heavy of a tool do we have to be able to strip people of that Airbnb? So it's really related to Airbnb participating and, and assisting us. And I, I must say we have made progress since in the last time. Uh, so we can get them removed from the platform, et cetera. So, you know, hit people in the pocketbook that way. And Airbnb has participated. Uh, uh, Roger Chapman and his team has been, have been in communication. And you're right. And I, and I know we always talk about, we just talked about, you know, um, some of these fitness clubs, we talk about Airbnb, the vast, we talk about the problem cases, but the vast majority of people are listening to the rules. And yeah. a lot of the fitness uh, places shut down when they were supposed to shut down and with the hardship that that means for them. So we're not going to let the others uh, take advantage of that. Uh, so uh, even for Airbnb and Airbnb is, is, has been participating and we'll continue to, uh, to work with them to, to remove those uh, sites from the platform. Ter terrific news. And last question back to the section 22 uh, dovetailing on Jenna's uh, comments of a private property. Uh, how does that apply to NCC parks and, and things like that? Would, would, would that be, in our wheelhouse as well do we have yeah, so, the, of that? so enforcement on ncc property first the, the uh, section 22 when if if it uh, applies and even the provincial order does apply to ncc property uh, even though it's federal property the enforcement generally should be done by the ncc their um, their conservation officers aren't sworn in as provincial officers but uh, rcmp are and uh, we've, uh, as we were preparing this work we've been having uh, discussions with them um, and they are uh, um, uh, very supportive corporate citizens and they, they've said we'll dovetail in whatever you believe are proper public health measures and we'll implement them on our territory as well too um, and the enforcement will be done either by the RCMP or Ottawa police will be uh, supporting them um, so that that is lined up and, and we're ready to go too so you'll see uh, a similar approach on NCC parks and on the parkways etc enforcement 
uh, the times of closures and that are very different. So I don't know if they're going to do do that. We're, and as Brent says, uh, for Section 22, we're still currently working on some of this stuff as we speak. Excellent. I don't want to, we've gone too long here today. Just a quick shout out. Uh, I got to take my mom to the uh, Ruddy YMCA in Orleans for her shot. I, the coordination between bylaw, administration, the people actually doing the shot in and out, 20 minutes, bumper to bumper. What a smooth uh, process. So thank you, everybody. Great to hear. That, thank that, you. That's great to, to hear. Uh, just a, a, a minor point of, uh, of clarification. The, the hours of operation for uh, parks is not... Uh, a public health uh, issue, not part of the Section 22, and that's uh, that's the City of Ottawa yeah. uh, would be looking at that. Correct. Excellent Good point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and last but not least, um, before we have questions from the traditional media, uh, is uh, Councillor Meehan. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, and uh, I know everyone's tired, so I'll make it fast, but uh, I just need to go over uh, a an issue that's facing us here in the South End and Gloucester, South the Pean and Barhaven. Um, the most current numbers we have on clusters put our area at over a thousand cases. Uh, that's the, the cluster number of, of COVID cases in, in the neighborhoods. So I need to know, um, because we're not socially, socially or economically disadvantaged, but we do have a large ethnic population with a large, great deal of, I would say, vaccine hesitancy. Um, what do I do? What does Councillor Hart, what do we do in order to hit those neighborhoods and to get the message out that people should be immunized and or they should be tested? So I, I just we need some direction here on where to go and how to how to handle this. Yeah, no, thanks for that question. I, I mean, I guess the first part would be to um double check the numbers over what time period for what population you know that sort of thing um just to see you know what uh, what what what's occurring um and i mean i think that um you know i think we're looking at what those numbers look like compared to to the the, the 21 um high priority neighborhoods that have been identified to date as i've indicated we've been wanting to um uh, you know, identify over time additional ones. Um, well, let's say, let's just say, for instance, we have identified it as, as a high priority neighborhood, Dr. Blalock. What do we do? What do we do now to, to get the message out to, the, to these communities? So, I mean, it, so for our high priority neighborhoods, so the 21 that have I've been identified, then, then the stat, outreach staff um, from Ottawa Public Health work with community partners, including, you know, community health centers, um, other sort of community organizations to uh, focus on disadvantaged uh, communities and uh, well, these are not disadvantaged communities. These, these are these are and a lot of people. Uh, they're they're well-to-do communities, but they have there's generations in there that that you know are maybe don't speak the language, uh, mm -hmm. don't understand uh, the, the the risk here. Right. No, I, I, yes, no, I understand. I mean, so, I mean, we would work uh, through our community outreach team to use uh, information and disseminate information in, in a variety of languages and formats. Um, you know, as, as, uh, as we discussed earlier this afternoon, um, we've done uh, webcasts in multiple languages, been on um, ethnic cultural radio stations, um, having uh, virtual events, uh, you know, there's a whole series of different strategies that we've used okay. to engage with, uh, with, with communities, uh, exactly. to, to make them aware. And, and some of this started in the fall, quite frankly, yeah. uh, in terms of making people aware of COVID and, and where to get a mask and, and how to protect yourself and what's involved. Uh, we've continued with respect to uh, around access to testing and having wraparound supports, uh, uh, although that is, uh, you know, uh, for more uh, disadvantaged populations, but rather, to, uh, and also to have, you know, people with different language skills from our community engagement group at our community test sites. Uh, and we're using the same sort of strategies for engagement that, uh, around vaccines. So Councillor Harder and I then should go to Ottawa Public Health after this is over and say, how, how do we initiate some of this for our community? Okay, so we will do that. Number two is um, there, we have a, a lot of kids gathering in parks at night and uh, you know, kids being kids, they don't think that this, that this affects them in any, any way. Uh, 
I don't even think that if we told them that the number of cases doubling in hospitals every 12 days would, would affect them at all. And they're not wearing masks. So have we considered rapid testing at some of these uh, areas, these parks that are perennially busy at night? To sh should, just to, to test some of these kids to show them that some of them are COVID positive, that, that they can spread it because we've got to do something to get the message across to these kids because they are going to be super spreaders if they continue to gather the numbers that they are. So, I mean, my, my first reaction is, is in terms of what needs to happen um, in, in the next now, uh, you know, is, is, is that, I mean, people basically need to be staying with their households. Like we really, we need everybody, every family, every person, to be staying staying with their household and and to bend this um i understand uh, but so that's the first thing and so the second thing that comes to mind is when um we've uh you know done sort of rapid testing uh on uh for 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 students um you know the the people at most risk have frankly not shown up uh and 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 so we we have uh you know groups that uh um, have had, uh, you know, lower risks of, of COVID, so to speak. Um, so I, I think that, uh, you know, the, the sorts of community ambassador kind of thing that, uh, that Dan Chenier was talking about, and I know it's being done in, uh, um, uh, with various groups, uh, as well to, to, uh, in terms of youth engagement. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think this is a bigger sort of, of, of challenge. Uh, and I mean, I guess the other thing, of course, is, is the testing piece is, is, an, is an a prevention piece. Um, you well, know, it you may do. raise awareness if they participated, but it, to actually control in a population, you'd have to test people multiple times a week, every week. And, and so that's not really feasible. Um, but really, I think it's, uh, you know, various partners, whether it's parents, community associations, um, uh, there may be an enforcement role here as well um, to, to uh basically that we can't have social gatherings now uh that's going to continue to fuel this and uh, we're going to get to a place we really don't want to be mm -hmm. can we just talk about the spread a bit, a, in a minute because you know we are seeing more cases than we than we saw this time last year and which which quite frankly is very discouraging for many of us who are doing the right thing so uh, maybe it's because people, the virus is invisible and people, uh, they don't think that they've got it. So they don't think there's a problem, but is this a virus? When you say the virus is out there, it's out there, but it's in people, right? It's not floating around. It's not something that you can get walking into a place. It's, it's going to be from caught from contact from somebody else's spittle to somebody else. Right. That's, Correct. that's the challenge. Yes. Yeah. So that's why the masks are going to be so important. Okay. So um, uh, um, one thing I will mention, and I think to, to Mr. Damani and to, and to Steve Kanalakis, if, if he's listening, I would love to see uh, staffing up of bylaw. bylaw um, the bylaw staffing is, is, uh, is good, but um, it was done before pandemic and um, they're st being stretched to the limit. And if we're gonna be asking them to go out to our parks and to, to ticket and to educate, um, going into a really probably another really beautiful summer it's it's gonna it's gonna take a toll on our frontline officers so I would love to I know it takes a while to to train bylaw and to uh, get them ready for the job but I think uh, we have to set the wheels in motion uh, that we we need to beef up our staffing there so um, I want to thank everybody um, for all the work you've been doing um, but I really need to hit some of these priority neighborhoods uh, where um, the message just doesn't seem to be resonating and with those young people. Uh, but I'm, I'm told that I was out visiting to the parks today that nothing's going to get through to these kids, that they, their kids being kids, they, they just don't believe that they're going to be affected. Um, maybe a public relations campaign where it shows up some of the people who are now in hospital and little kids getting sick and teenagers getting sick. Maybe we've got to put a different face on the, the, the COVID victim right now uh, to show people that uh, that person who looks like them actually got sick. Uh, I don't know what it's going to do to, to, uh, to take, what's going to take to get the message through, but um, if we don't, we're going to be back in the situation. And I find that very scary. So that's it for me, but thank you.
Thank you, and uh, thank everybody uh, who had had questions. Um, my understanding is we're now going to take a, a ten minute break, um, and then uh, OPH and city staff will take uh, will take questions from uh, from the uh, uh, traditional media. So we'll see everybody in a few minutes.
glass of water, taking a bio break. media agency in reverse alphabetical order today. You may ask one question with one follow-up. Nous allons maintenant répondre aux questions des médias en ordre alphabétique inverse. Right now we're going to ask, answer the question of the media in inverse alphabet, alphabetical order. Stay on mute until you have to ask your question. spring except for passive use you know walking through or or uh or, or whatnot why not just go that route it just uh, it seems like there's a lot of loopholes and and you're, you've left the public very confused so i, I think uh pat that's a, a good uh, a good question and we uh would debate it what we attempted to do is meet our public health objective understanding we're at a stay stay at home order so uh, in certain communities um, that uh, parks are the only outlet perhaps to get outside uh, and uh, you know be able to get some uh, um, uh, some some fresh air uh, and and still uh, you know respect the public health um, requirements that we need to all do to, to stop uh, covid from continuing to spread um, yes we had shut everything down the first time and it had uh, implications on on what i've just described so this approach was one where we wanted to be a little bit more um, surgical and strategic, and uh, we want to only target those parks where uh, we saw events uh, like last week that uh, really put uh, the great work that the community is doing and the vast majority of people are doing to, to not continue. I think we heard clearly from Dr. Malotny today um, of what we're facing as far as uh, the health uh, challenges in this community with regards to ICU, the, the healthcare system, et cetera. And I'll, I'll, I'll even talk to that if he wishes or on another question, but um, this is a balanced approach and um, we'll be, uh, you know, limiting the number of the hours uh, from 11 till nine in, in certain um, parks. And what that does for us is it allows us to intervene rapidly uh, in daylight when things start going awry before things go down the wrong path. And then we're, you know, at midnight going into a park when it's dark and it's a completely different intervention that's required then. So I think it's a balanced approach, uh, Pat, that we're, uh, we're attempting to do here and still meet our objectives. And, and we're gonna be, you know, consulting with the, um, the ward councillors and this can evolve, right? Some may um, be added, others may be removed if things are going well. So we want it to be a little bit more flexible. And on the enforcement side, um, you know, if we get another weekend like we did last weekend with uh, you know, summer like temperatures and, and you're overwhelmed with calls, um, like where are you with resources? Like how many officers do you have and, and yeah. to police all these parks? So uh, we have a, a dedicated team of eighth officers that will be um, uh, doing these parks. And obviously, you know, as we're signaling, we're going to be looking at the um, the parks which we know are identified as more problematic, not the, the small parkettes in some neighborhoods that, you know, nothing normally happens there except, uh, you know, families enjoying it. Um, Ottawa police are also, uh, we uh, bylaw has been the lead since the beginning of this pandemic and police have been there to support us when to keep the peace in certain circumstances, but they will now be playing a more active role. So they'll help us patrol and, and certainly in, in those uh, parks they'll be there and we're gonna have uh, combined teams as well too. And on the NCC property in federal land, instead of uh, bylaw uh, doing that as well, which we were doing, uh, the NCC is going to assume that responsibility, either with the RCMP or Ottawa police in some sort of fashion. So we're spreading out the work a little bit more. We're calling on colleagues to help us out. And um, we've also uh, will be adding um, some of our um, 
our summer students are coming online as well too and they'll be dedicated uh, just to this uh, to this activity so it's a balance uh, of other things because as you mentioned as well over and above that there's other work there's you know we've had issues with airbnbs and a whole bunch of other things that we have to also have resources to respond to that as well so it's a bit of a balanced approach with uh, more support from other agencies thanks thanks a lot Thank you, Pat. Uh, la prochaine question sera de Radio Canada. Benjamin Vachet. The question will be from Radio Canada. You have the floor. Go ahead. Thank you so much. How about the putting roadblocks on the bridges? because you want to reduce the numbers of back and forth between the two provinces. Are you thinking about roadblocks? Uh, Chair, do you want me to take that? I'm just looking towards you. It's a bit of a political question, but I can take it. The mayor addressed it at the earlier press conference and I can repeat what he said. You can't hear me? Chair, do you wish me to want me to take that question from the? It was it's about interprovincial travel. I do, I do. Okay. I just I couldn't hear you, Tony. Okay. I'm not sure if it's the translation or what, but okay. I couldn't hear you. No problem. Donc, euh, je vais répondre à la question. C'est une question um, d'ordre politique. Je sais qu'il y a eu des discussions. Entre... I will answer this political question. I know discussions were held between the two governments. We are not being involved. However, the mayor of Gatineau talked to, to uh, the mayor of uh, Ottawa this week as well as uh, last week, and uh, they really wouldn't want uh, citizens uh, to uh, cross the river on one side and the other one. For example, if someone uh, lives uh, in Gatineau and works in Ottawa, uh, it is different, but This decision of closing the bridges or uh, not leaving them across uh, the, uh, the border between uh, Quebec and Ontario uh, is important. However, both mayors stress that the border should not be crossed. Of course, this is not being allowed. Do you have another question, a follow-up? You are saying that it is a political question. However, does the Ottawa Public Health recommend it? It could maybe uh, slow down uh, the spread. Yes, it is a political decision. Not only is it being supported, but it is being taken with a scientific approach, it would be the Chief Officer of Health of Ontario with, uh, uh, of course, it is uh, public health that is uh, giving uh, the uh, recommendation, but uh, it won't be them who will take the decision. It will be at uh, uh, the level of Dr. Williams, uh, in Ontario, as well as Asidala. Um, just to add to, to that, I mean, the the province of Ontario in their um, um, shutdown, lockdown regulations uh, going on with that do um, recommend against interprovincial travel. So it's, it's a recommendation from the Chief Medical Officer of Health. will be from the Ottawa Sun. John Willing, please go ahead. Thank you. A question for Dr. Malagny. Um, are you considering any other class orders uh, for outdoor public spaces that aren't parks? So I'm thinking about other city rights away, perhaps sidewalk areas, perhaps shopping districts like the market. I don't know. But any thoughts about class orders in a similar vein? Um, 
thank you for that question. Nothing that uh, is is planned. Uh, I mean, we're ready to to respond to you know things that we see. We, you know, I don't think we're going to enforce our way out of this. Uh, you know, if if you saw the the slide deck that I presented, you know the we're not going to have vaccine that's going to get us out of this current uh, surge right this minute and and the need for for personal action uh, to right now to uh, to prevent uh, further hospitalizations. I, I think that, you know, for all the interactions that we might have if we're walking down the street or walking through the park, um, we really need to be maintaining that distancing uh, of two meters or more from other people outside our household. We need to have a mask with us at all times. Um, and uh, I do think that, uh, you know, if there were sort of recurrent issues, uh, then there are various options that, uh, that, uh, that the city could, could look at even under the mask bylaw. Thanks for that, Doctor. Just to follow up for uh, Mr. DeMonte, I was actually shocked to hear that bylaw officers weren't considered in the primary vaccination phase. And I know these are your staff, and I wonder if uh, you've done any advocacy or your colleagues across the province to, make, to try to get bylaw officers prioritized for vaccinations. So the answer is uh, yes to both those questions. They are in phase two, the first priority group. Uh, they've been added there as a result of the advocacy. They weren't even in that group initially, John. Uh, uh, the Association of uh, Municipal Enforcement Officers also did some advocacy. Um, what I can tell you is uh, we are kind of entering that. So some of our bylaw officers uh, at end of day, I mentioned that we have a list for healthcare workers and some other priority um, individuals. And when there are the odd uh, one or two vaccines, uh, as you know, if you've been to one of our a mass vaccination sites bylaw does a traffic control invites people from their cars to come in when it's their time etc so, so those officers uh, were with the uh, the medical team there uh, takes advantage and uh, has been immunizing them because we've recognized uh, they're on the front line so um, uh, you know like we've been telling earlier and uh, we had colleagues um, uh, rather counselors asking uh, the questions too unfortunately we we have to follow the provincial rules there's limited uh, maneuvering room that we have. So uh, we have to make sure that we're vaccinating those uh, by the provincial priority and they are in it now. So we take advantage of it. But uh, uh, again, I, I, I keep repeating this, but limited vaccine gives us limited capability to get through groups right now. Great, thank you, sir. Thank you, John. Our next question will be from the Ottawa citizen, Elizabeth Payne, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, it's a question for Dr. Malachny. Um, hoping you can help with this because many reporters have been trying to figure it out this week. Do you understand why K2V postal code was selected as a provincial hotspot? So, so the province uh, through the ICES uh, selected um, in their language hotspots in, in a number of cities, including Ottawa. Uh, we have uh, been using um, uh, our own analysis of, of, of neighborhood data to, to identify our high priority neighborhoods uh, and have been uh, working you know, closely with those communities, community groups, uh, providers to uh, um, make them aware of, 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 of COVID vaccine and, and, and delivering uh, pop-up uh, uh, clinics and, and even micro pop-up clinics that were, were described earlier. And so really we're working in tandem um, in terms of the province identifying these FSAs and in, into the provincial booking system and, and our own work with our own booking system for the high priority neighborhoods, uh, which we started even before the provincial booking system was up. Um, so, uh, and we're, we'll continue to have conversations with, with the province in terms of uh, working together to, to get those that in most need to be immunized. Uh, but if there's no, if OPH has not identified any high risk neighborhoods within that area, um, how can, I mean, could this have been a mistake? I know OPH is engaging with the province on this. Are, are you trying to figure that out, asking that it be changed? Um, anything else? Um, we've provided to, to the province the, uh, uh, the areas of our, of our high priority neighborhoods that we think are, are the highest priority for, uh, for, for vaccine. So we've, we've provided that to them. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Liz. Uh, la prochaine question sera du journal Le Droit. Julien Paquette, c'est à vous. Julien Paquette, Le Droit. Uh, if, uh, if the 
I think that at the point we're in, where you you've uh, you've explained pretty clearly today that uh, uh, the path we're on is very dangerous, especially in, for hospitals and the the capacity to uh, to provide care to everyone who needs it. Uh, is relying on the the good faith of uh, of everyone a good strategy at this point? Do we need or do we need more than that? Uh, seeing what how people have reacted to the uh, stay at home order this this last weekend is that uh, I know we're trying to adjust, but uh, should we be asking even more from from people than like forcing them to stay home or uh, just trying to I don't know if you understand the question, but yeah, no, no, I understand, Julian. Thank you for for the question. Um, I, I really do think, like much of this uh, pandemic for for more than a year now, has been um, on on what we do individually and as families and and as communities. Uh, it's been a you know obviously a challenging year, and we've all had our own sort of experiences with that, and we're tired. Um, I, I think uh, there may not be an awareness. And then so we were wanting to begin to address that today, that this situation is different than what we've had over the past year um, and that we really do need action. Uh, and it's really individual. Um, and I, I, I think in terms of um, other sorts of, 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 of opportunities. Uh, I mean, I, I do think that there is the opportunity to review what we've had in our lockdowns previously, what have been done in other countries. And, uh, we, you know, I think that's a provincial role to, to have that reviewed by the science table and the public health measures table to see if there's other opportunities to, to tweak the, uh, the, uh, the existing provisions. But I think ultimately it does come down to us like this is our community, this is our hospital. These uh, are the services that we or our family or our friends and others are gonna need. Um, and we want them there for us when we need them. And uh, you know, the people working in our hospitals uh, who've been working tirelessly through this, they're tired too. And now they're facing this and it's, and it's potentially gonna be really, really difficult uh, in terms of the type of care and decisions that they're gonna need to make. So I, I think ultimately it comes down to each of us. And I think there's a role for uh, other voices, uh, for, for other sort of elected officials, community leaders, business groups, and others to lend their voice to say, you know, we have a problem here and we all need to work together to make a difference and bend this now. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I understand it was a it was a tough question to answer. Um, dans la même veine, uh, Monsieur Dimanté, uh, est-ce qu'il y a est-ce qu'il y a une crainte uh, oui. de voir, par exemple, do you fear, for example, we are uh, controlling the hours of uh, uh, opening the parks, for example, at Mooney's Bay? Can people maybe go to another park and maybe stay later? Are we uh, avoiding uh, to, uh, more surveillance of those parks? Yes, we are actively surveying those parks. However, uh, the police uh, will be helping us. They will be patrolling all the parks. So we will be able to, to monitor everything. I would like to repeat what Mr. Malotny uh, said in English with regard to the person in charge of implementing those regulation, the enforcement side of the equation. We want democracy and we believe that enforcement, as Dr. Malotny said, Everyone has to accept that of course, this is a tool for us to intervene amongst 
those who do not respect the rules, but most citizens do respect those rules. I believe that we should maybe uh, intervene faster, of course, yes, but it won't uh, bring a solution. As we said earlier, we have to take our responsibility and we have uh, to uh, change uh, the curve and the uh, regulation. The regulations are important for uh, the majority of the population. Merci, Julien. Our next question will be from CTV News. Josh Pringle, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. My question is for uh, Mr. DeMonte. You said during the uh, presentation to councillors that there's a delay in the Moderna doses arriving. Any indication on how long the delay is at this point? I know it's still relatively new information. Any idea how long you'll be waiting for this shipment? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't, as we've been on this um, uh, this call today, uh, back and forth, the texts have been coming in. We've been uh, texting the province. Uh, it's a provincial problem that uh, it's not just Ottawa, but the Moderna seems that the normal uh, doses that we would be getting as we get uh, Pfizer every week and Moderna every second week, there seems to be in the next couple of weeks some challenges there. We're trying to look at what that what those numbers are and what that means. So I don't have details right now, um, but obviously the the planning team for us this is important because you know we I think you can see we've got some pretty nice momentum going in here in Ottawa. Every week we're increasing the number of people that we're able to vaccinate and. Uh, we run out of uh, vaccine every week, and now this will be unfortunately a uh, a dip and a, and a turn in the wrong direction for a period of time. But as soon as we have that detail, we'll be communicating it. And certainly, if it has impacts, we're going to certainly communicate what impacts it may have. But uh, I can't answer that right now. I don't have the details. Thank you. And my follow-up question is for Dr. Malachny. Um, you said during your presentation that hospitals are preparing for 200 hospitalizations as we see a doubling every 12 days. As of right now, do they need to take further steps beyond what they're doing right now with canceling uh, non-elective surgeries or are they prepared, right? Or will they need to do more going forward? Yeah, I think that the, the hospitals are in the best position to, to answer specific questions about what they're planning. My understanding and my discussions with them is, is, is yeah, it's definitely on their radar that, uh, you know, if, if the trend continues, you know, we're just short of 100 now, that that means 200. So, uh, you know, you've seen the, uh, the steps that they're taking now to, to uh, manage the 100, but they are, 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 you know, planning in terms of the what if and to be ready uh, for if, if it hits 200. And with the, with the concomitant increase in, in ICUs as well. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question will be from City News. Eric O'Brien, please go ahead. Uh, there you go. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Mr. DeMonte, uh, you know, we often talk about um, the race between vaccines and variants in the third wave, particularly. Um, now, given the current situation in Ottawa right now, um, how concerning is it that you may be looking to cancel vaccine appointments due to this gap with the uh, with new shipments of the Moderna vaccine? Yeah, I, I don't think I, I can accept the premise of your question right yet. I don't know, think we're there canceling yet, but that could be, uh, to your point, that could be something that could happen. We're waiting to hear on that. It is very concerning. Um, you know, um, Dr. Malotny said, like, where we're at now, we're not going to vaccinate our way out of this right now. So we have the public health measures. And I think he's described clearly uh, what's going on in our community. So that's our first priority. If I do a hierarchy, the second priority is to continue vaccinating and to get to herd immunity and to particularly get to our high risk community, which we've been doing. And we've been doing, I would say, a very good job on that. And so we need vaccine to do that. So on the third element of the vaccine, uh, I am a little concerned uh, to hear today that, uh, you know, Moderna may, we may have a, a challenge and what does that mean? The team's looking at what that means. Can it be replaced with something else? Can we get more AstraZeneca? Can we get more Pfizer? I don't know. Uh, those are the questions we're asking the province. So for me, it is concerning because um, um, our, my role in this as part of this broader team is uh, we're getting our, our science and um, the targets that we need from both the province and, and here locally from our medical officers of health 
to chat to to hit the, hit the right communities. Uh, the machine is there; it's running. And we're getting uh, we're getting vaccinations done. And here, unfortunately, we go again, perhaps with a a lull in vaccine. So that's very frustrating too for the team. And uh, I would tell you from a, an operational perspective, when you have a machine running. A stopping and going is probably the worst thing you want. You want the machine to continue running and then you continue to increase it. So, um, you know, I was asked and, and have as public health is with all their information that we put on our website, I was asked a question to be very transparent. This is something that we're looking at right now. Um, I'm hoping that we have a solution in the next few days from the province about this and uh, we'll see where that takes us. And I'm hoping that we don't end up having to, uh, to cancel appointments or slow our, our pace down. Yeah, because it is, you know, to a certain degree, kind of a nightmare scenario to have to cancel, start canceling first, uh, first vaccinations. Absolutely. Absolutely. We don't, we don't want to go there. So let's not get there yet. Because what I said at the beginning, I, that's not what we're doing now. But, uh, you know, that is a scenario that we may look at, uh, we may have to look at if we, we don't get, but there may be some other options of, uh, you know, getting vaccine from somewhere else or another type of vaccine. And, and I certainly don't want to slow down the, the, the movement that we have now, the direction we're in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Um, our next question will be CBC Ottawa, Joanne Chianello, please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, Dr. Malachny, uh, we've heard a lot of confusion about what's allowed, what's not allowed, whether people don't understand the rules or they're purposely looking for loopholes. So one question I have about the masks in parks, you see people, you know, playing ball hockey on the road, uh, shooting hoops, doing all kinds of things, um, and not just kids, you know, adults too. Um, why not bring in a mask for, um, you gotta just wear a mask outdoors all the time, or, or maybe just at parks, like just instead of like trying to figure out the specific um, you know, busy places to do it. Why not just say uh, at parks, you got to wear a mask the way we do for transit, for example. Yeah, no, thanks for that. Um, so I, I think we're trying to um, be balanced in, in our approach. Uh, I mean, we want people to use parks. Uh, we want people uh, to do that for the mental health and, and physical activity benefits. Um you know, many times you can you can walk through a park and there's you know no one there or or very few and it's very easy just to you know walk around each other and and have distancing and just be a momentary passing. Um, but really, we're seeing the the the, the challenge um, in in certain sort of amenities and and with crowding around those. And uh, so I, I, we think it makes most sense to, to, uh, to do something in the way of a, of a Section 22 uh, class order for those situations, sort of just like we did for the winter amenities, uh, you know, where, where we had specific issues around, for example, rinks and trailheads. So we're using a, a similar approach, but I think our overall message is that, you know what, you should have a mask with you at all times. If you're, you know, around other people and there's going to be any issue with distancing, put your mask on. And, and I think this is um, what people should just be doing to protect themselves and protect their families. But I think for, for areas where we're seeing crowding, we'll, we'll take an additional step and, and, and uh, make it mandatory. And related to that, I heard you say, you know, some people look for loopholes because there's gatherings of five allowed outdoors and you recommend that people don't get together with their households. But, you know, I just checked with the solicitor general's office and you're actually not allowed to gather um, with people outside your households, even on your deck, right? You're, you're just not allowed to leave your home for non-essential reasons. And I recognize that the province, the way they put out the rules have made it easy to find a loophole. It's, it's not clear to people. So can you or Mr. Jamonte, maybe both would be great. Like, I think people would just like to be told exactly what they can and cannot do. So can you guys tell us? Well, I, I can start Dr. Malotny if you want. I mean, you're right, Joanne, uh, the rules are clear. Um, we're an enforcement agency. We, in, we enforce the laws and regulations of the province of Ontario and the, the municipality or, or the federal government if there's, if there's laws that we enforce at the federal level. Um, and we have to follow the, the rules that are there and you just describe them where none of that is technically quote unquote legal. That said, every officer has um, 
a, a judgment that they, they apply to each situation. So if you're asking me from an enforcement standpoint, those activities are illegal and would require an intervention if we were, we were faced with that, but we use discretion. But Brent can talk to you more from a clinical perspective, his opinion, how this impacts what's going on with our community. Yeah, no, thanks for that, Tony. And and uh, you, clearly you can see that I don't in, enforce uh, the uh, the regulations. Um, the uh, From a public health perspective, our, our message is pretty clear uh, that uh, you should only be with your household, um, that, uh, you know, when you're outside and you're going to be within uh, in proximity of other people, you should be maintaining distancing uh, and wearing a mask uh, and certainly not going out if you're ill. So, so I don't think anything has really changed in terms of the basic public health advice. Um, that got us out of the, the previous surges and we need to all do it now to get out of this one. All right, thanks very much. Ceci conclut la séance technique d'aujourd'hui. This is the end. end of our technical session today. Thank you very much to everyone for joining. Thank you to our interpreters and our translators who have been working for hours. Uh, and uh, thanks again for your time. Have a good evening.